Good morning. Good morning. We will call this work session to order. And thank you all for being here. Uh, if we could just have a moment of silence for the incident that happened in Virginia this uh, past weekend or uh, week. Um, the shooting that we had in the, uh, I think it was in the municipal uh, um, area with the, which was like the water and sewer authority. So if we could just give maybe a moment of silence for those who uh, were wounded and also those who died in this event. Thank you so much. Thank you. This morning, Clerk, do we have any public comment? Yes. Okay. <coughs> we have uh, one, two, three citizens signed up for public comment. We respect our citizens' right to address their government in this meeting. However, as the chair, I, I intend to force, uh, enforce three minutes. Um, I should have said the three-minute rule so this meeting can run effectively and efficiently. Uh, once you finish your si sentence after the three minute rule, you will hear a, bu a buzzer. So, of course, when you hear the buzzer, I ask that you wrap the sentence up. Please avoid campaigning or personal attacks against any officials or any uh, body in this room. Um, and also, uh, we would like this meeting to be held in a very Thank civil you. manner. Um, I will start with our first um, citizen, Chantel Fleming. If you could please <coughs> come forward. Hello, Shantia. How are you? Uh, um, I'm not quite sure how I fall into this, this citizen or not, but first of all, hello. I'm Deputy Coroner Chantel Fleming, and I'm a licensed coroner in the state of Georgia. And today I'm here to introduce myself to the board as well as the community. In our personal and professional lives, we are constantly hit with different types of adversity against one another which most of them, we have no control <coughs> over those. But there are four things that we can control, and that's how we react, how we adapt, and how we breathe and live, and the actions that we take upon what has happened to us. My reactions for the past few weeks is the reason why I'm here today. I understand there are a few citizens that have requested information or asked some questions about who is she, where am I from, and am I qualified for the position? And I hope a lot of the citizens are here today so I can finally get to meet you. Besides hiding behind the endless phone calls, the emails, the social media attacks on character, my career, my well-being, and not, let, not forget the elephant in the room that some have brought up, my race. In this day and time, this type of action is called cyberbullying. And today I take a stand to say that I will not be bullied, I will not be harassed, and I will not simply adjust to the behavior in this county. However, on a brighter side, I like to say thank you. I've been welcomed by so many of the community, and I want to say thank you again, and I'm honored to serve. You know, Eleanor Roosevelt stated that you gain strength, courage, and confidence by all your experience. And once you stop and look fear directly in the eye, you're able to say, I can get through this. I can move on to the next step, and I come a long way. This leads me to tell you guys how I live and how I breathe. And this is by working as a profession. This is something that I was born to do. I've been a licensed coroner for the past two and a half years of my four-year term, and I look forward to growing more and more in the organization. I can assure you that I'm qualified for this position. I'm a college graduate with proper training and up-to-date certification that fully upholds me in this position. I currently transfer from a small town in South Georgia called Calhoun County in Edison, where I was the deputy coroner there. I'm here now in Douglas County to continue to serve my sworn duties with integrity and grace. And plus, it was a little closer to home, to my family and friends. And lastly, my actions. I will continue to uphold my oath of office. 
I will continue to assist the coroner at her discretion by restoring dignity and faith in the, com in the community, in the coroner's office, excuse me, <clears throat> as well as moving forward as a citizen of, Calhoun, of Douglas County. Once again, my name is Chantel Fleming, and I'm the deputy coroner of the county. Thank, Thank you. you so much, uh, Ms. Fleming. We appreciate you coming and uh, giving that presentation. We appreciate you so much. Uh, next, we have Mr. Pro professor, should I say Professor Tomaski, if you could please come forward. Your subject matter this morning is Fox Hall. Is that your subject matter? Okay. Yes, ma'am. Uh, State your name and address for us, please. Uh, John Tomaski, successes with Parkway Douglasville. In uh, November of 2016, the uh, Foxhall uh, proposal got approval from the uh, board of that day. However, uh, <coughs> that was a third attempt, and uh, <coughs> Harrison Merrill was quite. Uh, conscientious in not taking no for an answer <coughs> until he finally got the approval on I think what was the third bite of the apple, but without any bond guarantee whatsoever because the uh, chairman and board of that day were not having that at all. And last Monday, a self-described old lady showed a lot more acumen about economics than anyone at or associated with the Development Authority when she pointed out that good projects don't lack financing. Financiers are looking for good projects, and when one arises, especially one that gets a lot of publicity, they're on it like ants on sugar. So the point is, why on earth in a market economy where we have a free and open capital market, does the county have to guarantee anything that has to do with a project that keeps coming back and back and back? Now, in November of 2016, it was known there was going to be new composition on the board and new leadership because that approval took place after the last election. So now, we have a situation where this board is now entertaining, which should never have been entertained in my opinion, and also, again, according to the economics as explained by that self-described old lady. Now, Another aspect of uh, Mr. Merrill is that as he wouldn't take no for an answer, he doesn't take yes for an answer. Because once he had that approval, they kept coming back and back to chip away at the requirements under existing law and code regulations having to do with safety, road construction, on and on and on. So really, there has been an ongoing waste of time for a project, apparently, which is a non-starter, keeps coming back with more lipstick on the pig. And I would like to think that these evident facts, the evident facts which have supported the opinions I've mentioned, will be taken into account by the members of this board. And I will uh, forego any further commentary until perhaps tomorrow evening if in, ma in fact this matter is on that agenda. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Jamaski. We appreciate your comment. We'll take this matter under advisement. Um, last but not least, we have Mr. Larry Pierce. Mr. Pierce, please come forward. State your name and address, and I see your topic is hiring deputy coroner, new deputy coroner. I was trying to reach your writing. Please. Larry Pierce, mm -hmm. 4120 Van Sant Road, Douglasville, Georgia. Well, as they say, 
Custer wishes he had a Gatling gun. And you know what? I'm going to tell you something kind of funny real quick. When the chair lady was sitting there, I honestly, the reason I'm wearing this hat today and not the other one is because I did not know Judge McLean was behind her, sitting down in a small chair, kind of hiding. And when I kind of went here and there and acted like I normally do and hitting a few wood things, I was sitting there. When he got up, I felt like crawling under the chair. So I have to tell y'all, I did not know he was here, and I did not deliberately act that way for him. I acted that way for me. Now, on to the business. All right. The new coroner just spoke, and on her website, <coughs> she says that I am known as the embalming duchess, which is kind of royalty, property owner and all from England, is what duchess means. But let me tell you something. As usual, I didn't know what I was going to say till just last week. Now, if you will recall, when she was hired, when she was elected and won, she had three people, okay? And I brought it to your attention under the code section that it was improper and illegal, okay? And y'all didn't know about it because I know y'all not supposed to know the law. And I don't know the law either. But it's like when you get divorced, you learn real quick about laws. So under 45.16.7, it says, as y'all remember, she comes to you first. She didn't come nowhere. She's a friend of hers from 20 years back, according to her <coughs> website. And when I asked for the employment record, it showed she's employed as of 420. But guess what? When I asked for the application of employment, there wasn't one. Nope, Mr. Perry didn't have one. Mr. Perry's not at fault about it. It was filled out Friday. Here it is here. It was filled out Friday. So again, the coroner has said, I don't owe y'all the time of day. I'm going to do what I want to do. The law says otherwise. Right here, okay? Now here's something else. Who's on the list? Mr. Womack. Mr. Womack, not related to the chief at all. And he's over in Paulding County. So Mr. Womack is on the list as of last week. Mr. Womack sends her an email December 18th of last year. Madam, Corn. Uh, I need to quit because I got family problems and personal problems. I'm out of here. She never turned it in to personnel. So Miss Holman and all the rest of you, you think she's still he's still on the list? He's been gone. He's been gone six months. Mr. Pierce, your yes, time has expired. Pardon? Your time has expired. Okay. Well, one day we're going to get to the nits and crypts of it, and they're going to allow me five minutes to get excited. <laughs> but I'm going to say this one statement and finish. I'm going to send a letter of demand to the attorney that she be rescinded and go through the proper procedure. If the letter of demand doesn't work, I'm following an injunction with the court. Thank you. Thank you so much. We'll take this matter into advisement, uh, Mr. Pierce, and I appreciate you being here today. Uh, we have a couple of presentations with us. We have, <coughs> our schedule is rather tight, so we want to make sure we move this uh, uh, agenda along this morning. That's my intent. Um, I'm going to move some things uh, around just a little bit. Board of Commissioners, we have the approval of the minutes. I ask that you read your minutes, the minutes and be uh, prepared to approve accordingly tomorrow. And then our first presentation today is Retail Consultant Update and Chris Parker Development Authority. Thank you so much. I ask uh, so that the Board of Commissioners will be aware. I requested uh, Chris to please uh, provide the Board of Commissioners with the updates. We'll know what our retail is looking like. Are we are we bringing anything in? What are we getting? And I needed him to, if he could, wrap it up and just put it in a, just an envelope today to just let us know what's going on with our retail <coughs> in this county. Thank you so much, Mr. Proctory. We have to move. Good morning, Board of Commissioners. Uh, thank you for having us here today. Um, as a part of our strategic initiatives and objectives, um, we have a focus to hone in on uh, recruitment of retail uh, operations here in the community. And we did a lot of data to show what our potential is here in the community. Um, and we've, we've heard a lot from the citizens of the community about what's missing here, the things that they would like to see here. 
Um, retail recruitment um, is a lot of extensive work. Um, when you look at and you mix it into what we do on a regular basis with the other types of uh, economic development projects that we work on, um, it, it's something where a lot of times communities like ours find opportunities to bring in assistance to help uh, make it a reality. Um, so through the support of Georgia Power, um, we have a partnership with a firm called NextSite. Uh, they are a retail recruitment consulting firm um, based out of Alabama. Um, we have uh, Andy Camp, who is assigned to focus in on Douglas County. You know Andy very well for, for a number of years. Andy was, the, was my counterpart in Carroll County until he took on this role um, with NextSite. So Andy's going to give kind of an overview of who NextSite is, how our partnership works, and understanding about what's happening in the retail space, and allow you to be able to ask any questions you may have. So I'm going to turn the floor over to Andy. Thank you, Chris. I thank appreciate you, Chris, that. And thank you, Andy, for being here. Well, thank you all for having me. Um, and uh, it's really a joy to work with Chris and his team. I've uh, always admired everything that he does, and with John uh, on board there as well. Uh, we spend a, a lot of time talking about the community, things that we believe uh, are attainable, uh, also working with, uh, with them to find the best opportunities for backfilling sites or buildings um, with those businesses and opportunities. So I, I only have a few minutes this morning, and this is a pretty extensive subject. So I'm going to move pretty quickly. Uh, so there's a time for you all to ask a question or two at the end. Uh, and I want to be respectful of the fact that you have a large crowd today, so I'm sure there's uh, other things on your agenda. Well, thank you so much. <clears throat> Certainly. Um, first thing, uh, this is a pretty important part of every community's economy. Uh, retail accounts for about 12 to 20 percent of, of the jobs in, the, in a community, again, depending upon the landscape. Um, as you can see from this infographic, uh, it has quite a big impact uh, both statewide and nationally. Uh, a lot of jobs are created uh, through, uh, through <coughs> the uh, development of, say, a shopping center or a restaurant. Uh, many of those were our first jobs. Uh, I worked in a retail uh, establishment, uh, first the three jobs I had. So. Um, sold paint, sold shoes, and sold shoes again. It was a lot of fun. Um, so <clears throat> we like to help our communities focus on how, how can we grow this part of the economy and really manage some of the changes that come with it too because one thing about retail is that taste change, the consumer's interests are different, and there's always new brands rising and older brands that may be falling. So, uh, so the way we do that is through our partnership with Georgia Power and the community. Uh, by doing research, uh, preparing some marketing pieces, and then going out there and proactively recruiting what we think those opportunities are. So, uh, the research we do uh, is based upon mobile phone travel patterns as well as uh, the ability to look at where those consumers come in and out of the market. It's anonymous information, but it gives us a really good idea of where folks are coming in and out of. So, we can create what's called a regional trade area or, or a uh, intermediate trade area that goes beyond any political boundaries, which is where a lot of the census data and some of the other things kind of cap it off. So I can tell you that the uh, regional trade area for Douglasville and Douglas County extends well beyond the county boundary. Uh, as you all know, people come in and out for work uh, and um, other things all day long. So uh, we try to capture them while they're here. Uh, the other thing um, that well, what we do with that is we turn that into a marketing piece. We look at those opportunities and then we go out and we go to about 10 conferences a year. But we also have developer and retailer outreach that's ongoing all the time. Uh, being based out of Atlanta, I still live uh, nearby. Uh, I'm in Atlanta two, three days a week, a lot of times talking with folks, finding out what they're looking to do, where they're looking to make investments. Uh, so how does retail work? Well, you hear a lot of things about uh, how the internet's taking big bites out of things, things are changing. Uh, it's certainly true that we have a, a, a lot of square footage per capita in the United States compared to some other countries, but I think there's two things going on there with that. Uh, first and foremost is we have a lot of space. So when you start comparing the development patterns of France, Spain, Italy, and Germany to the way the United States work, you have to be closer to your customer, especially if you're selling things like groceries, right? Um, in addition to that, I think that uh, we end up with 
buildings that have lived their useful life as a retail location and now there's been probably something better that could be done there and, uh, and Chris and I even work on some of those specifically how can that be useful space to create jobs that may not be retail uh, so uh, even though we're a little flush on well the laser doesn't show up even though we're a little flush on square footage I feel like that really matches up with the way the United States is developed over time uh, so the internet still the lion's share of sales are done out of stores physical stores and if you take the um, pure online play you're going to be looking at uh, around 10 percent now that number's been growing a little bit and some things are changing I don't know if anybody's used things like Instacart or Clicklist or, or what have you but uh, you, you can purchase things online uh, but really most people are going to the store um, I wouldn't be comfortable buying my groceries all the time online. It's not to say I haven't tried it, but just I like to go. And I get inspired when I go into stores. And you see a lot of stores be very successful with that. Of course, there is some changing um, generational things uh, going on. Uh, you know, we talk about millennials a lot. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm in that Gen X range that just we don't seem to have a voice in this conversation a lot of times. <laughs> um, but there's, uh, there's definitely some things to be said about how things are being purchased. We look at that as well. Uh, but then here's the other thing. You kind of see the headlines of closures, but you don't hear of a lot of the headlines of openings because those are done usually one at a time as opposed to closures that could be up to four or 500 stores at a time when they're really you know, big headlines like, say, Payless. But what we're noting is that you know through consolidation, drug stores have started to close. Department stores have just kind of lost a little bit of favor. Uh, but you're seeing a lot of the mass merchants and the clubs, as well as the restaurants and convenience stores, really booming very much. And all that adds up to a net 3,800 um, gain in openings versus closings. It's there's still a lot going on. And all we have to do is just drive around the county, and we'll see it. You know, QT rebuilding. <coughs> Uh, there's other things that are uh, happening around the city. Uh, some stuff on Fairburn Road is really exciting. So um, those types of things are definitely hitting us locally as well. Uh, I'll skip through this just a little bit, but we'll just say the green bars are good. <laughs> um, and then the red bars, and you can see where department stores, this is the only category where there's been an actual loss, a bigger red bar than a green bar in the infographic. So. Um, uh, fast food, bars and restaurants are pretty rapidly opening all over. So uh, food is great, food is sustainable, people have to eat. We have not found a way to change that yet. So we like to put a lot of our stock in food. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about how, that, uh, how this process works. I'll borrow this from CCIM because I can't think of a better infographic that just kind of summarizes it all. Uh, so <clears throat> how do we do this? Well, our data helps us define those opportunities and we share that with everyone. Uh, everyone, by the way, has access through Chris's office to th these reports uh, if they're needed. Um, and what we look at are, what are the opportunities? What are the incomes of households and education and the gap support? What can we go out and, uh, and look to attract? Things like hardware and building materials, especially food, health and personal care. Uh, clothing is still opportunity, even though a lot of that's moved over to the internet over time. Sporting goods and hobbies, and then of course full and quick service restaurants are things that we see happening. So how does it work? Well, a lot of times we have sites looking for users or users looking for sites. Site looking for a user would be the for sale sign. Users looking for site is a lot of times where we come in and say, you need to be looking at this market. Douglasville would be a great place for you all to have a new restaurant, store, or whatever. We show them that it can work. And then they go out and they use their real estate team to try to solve that and find a location for it. Um, oftentimes, we refer them to locations, but um, just trying to figure out where it might be. But they're, they're going to do their own search most of the time. So, uh, And then there are, of course, a couple of things that become pretty important through that process. Uh, before they get to the decision to either move forward or not. Um, of course, the financial side of it, we're trying to solve two business problems. The business that's going to open, and then the business that's going to be the real estate that delivers the ability for them to have a, a location if they're not owner-occupied. Um, so, <clears throat> entitlement, uh, this, this part, entitlement permitting becomes pretty critical to that because of timing. 
I feel like we're moving in a great direction on that. Uh, we received some feedback, and uh, the de developers are well. We got a lot. We got kind of a, a pretty big bull market when it comes to the landowners. You know, they can kind of compress that time a little bit more uh, because they're receiving multiple offers often. Uh, so anything that can be done to help compress that, and I feel like we're getting to that point where permitting can be delivered in a time that they've tied up that site and gone through their vetting process. So. Um, then moving on through construction and into opening, uh, those can be often times where uh, the community can be very supportive to help get the word out and do other things along those lines. So I'm almost done. Then I won't give you guys a chance to uh, uh, ask a couple of questions. Um, <clears throat> I won't get too deep into the weeds on the site, but there are things about being on the you know north or south side or east or west side of the road based on traffic patterns and things. We live in a car-centric world. It's pretty tough, pretty tough in America if you don't have a vehicle, um, and that plays a lot into people's decisions on where to locate. Um, so, uh, <coughs> pipeline, and I'll have to use some discretion here just to maintain some confidentiality uh, as we work through um, trying to bring some of those brands into the community. I'm going to I'm going to toss out a couple of names like the thing you know because people recognize those more than they might the concept but there are some uh, there are some uh, fast casual restaurants that are in the community uh, some things uh, you know like uh, the nukes and the McAllisters of the world uh, there are a couple of uh, second locations for some quick service restaurants we're seeing uh, Fairburn Road become a, of interest for a couple of those that want to come into the market um, we have some uh, concepts that would go in line in shopping centers. Um, think of you know pickup or you know potentially uh, having a, a a window in capping a building or something along those lines as people might want to grab that on the way home. Uh, we talked about hobby and building materials and supplies, things along those lines. We think there's some additional opportunities there. Uh, those are a little harder to get because they take a little more space. Uh, and sometimes they want to be uh, in, a, in a new spot or they want to kind of out position or be near the competition. Uh, of course, uh, C stores are still very strong. Um, I think the racetrack finally, finally opened on Fairburn Road. Not, I guess that wasn't terribly long ago. Um, for what it's worth, I worked on that project about eight years ago. <laughs> so it does take some time. The same site, <laughs> same site. Uh, so, you know, uh, oftentimes it takes a while to, to come in and get things like that done. We're also seeing some of the home stores that are uh, really taking an interest in going in some uh, existing spaces, moving into the market. Those are all really wonderful things. Uh, a couple of other real quick things are going to be kind of specific to some certain areas. Uh, Thornton Road, south side of I-20, that's been a good story. We're starting to see some things come around there. Um, the north side of Douglasville with 92. Coming, uh, coming about where we'll be able to uh, not have to meander through town. I don't want that to sound like it's a good or a bad thing. It has its pros and cons. <laughs> um, <clears throat> we think that that might open up some opportunities for some more food on the north side, particularly uh, potential for grocery or some other restaurants. Um, Post Road in West Douglas County, uh, we, the feedback we get is we just have, that the rooftops just haven't gotten there yet there just hasn't quite been enough home construction um, you know there a lot of these folks are kind of chasing that you know trying to get right out there in front of it so with, as it comes in and it hits of course we talked about second locations Fairburn Road redevelopment uh, and then I would just encourage everybody to continue to always think about the small independent businesses and franchisees that are in the community and how they can be assisted uh, we find our data is very useful for them when they look at business plans and they want to understand what the market is. There's some really exciting stuff happening downtown. That could be very beneficial for those folks as well. Um, and then just an example of uh, some of the things that we use. Uh, I think it went by it. Sorry. Um, here's <coughs> part of the marketing guide. Sorry for the quality of it's a PDF file that gets print printed, and when I stretched it out, it just shows. But this gives us uh, the idea of what we're looking at from a trade area and all of those things, and it gives us kind of a quick conversation starter. Again, uh, Chris and team have all of that information as well. I'm pretty sure I went over a few minutes, so I apologize. Uh, do y'all have any questions? 
Thank you so much, Andy, and I appreciate your presentation. I, I want to just kick off with one question. The, I mentioned you, I believe you mentioned you're targeting some of the empty boxes. I call them empty boxes or offices around here. Are you focusing on those as well? I've seen quite a few empty places, particularly in the Lithia Springs area. Can you just tell us, are you trying to entice our uh, retailers to look at those stores, these empty boxes? So uh, when we have an empty store, that creates a great opportunity because typically the value of that is going to drive a lot more opportunities than if someone's trying to do ground up construction. Um, we're hearing that the cost to deliver at new centers is just getting very difficult because construction prices have risen more than the rent is keeping up with it. Uh, so what we would do is we would look at it, say it's in a center or you know in line in a small multi-tenant building. We would look at what that space is and then what might match up for a particular retailer and then what the demographics could support in the in the market immediately around it. Most of those are going to be um, either larger destination type, you know, uh, maybe off-brand clothing or some of the home stores that are trying to have a presence in the market. Um, sometimes we see some entertainment things coming into those as well. Um, you know, the uh, sky zones of the world and the, you know, the fun places for the kids to play, uh, as well as some adult entertainment too. Um, things like um, Dave and Buster's have gone into some of the things that, uh, you know, where you might have. Kind of adult yeah, yeah. Come <laughs> <laughs> on, well, Chris, I wouldn't even go in there. <laughs> Um, so we would uh, we would take a look at it from that perspective and similar to the what's missing and is this a chance for uh, an opportunity to do it. I'll tell you some exciting things that we get from our research too is where the customer has been before and after so if let's say there's a grocery store in that center we could we can map that and we can tell if they are going to some other places consistently uh, that might be a good chance to bring that to that center <coughs> as a second location in the community or first location in the community as people are driving out of the market to, to go patronize that business. And then we'll add to that. So um, Next site has uh, basically a few corridors that they're really focusing in on. So uh, Thornton Road, <coughs> south of 20, um, that Lee Road, Fairburn Road area, um, Fairburn Road kind of north of, of 20 in downtown Douglasville and then um, Post Road um, and I-20. Those are kind of the main, the main areas of focus uh, that, that, that they are really tasked with working on. So they're not doing every um, a location throughout throughout the county, but those are the areas that they're focusing. Okay, thank you so much. And, and, and if it doesn't work in one of those spots, we definitely get on mm -hmm. the phone with Chris and the team to make sure we can find a way to try to get it. Oh, and how we find them. And how we find them. And then, Board of Commissioners, have some questions for you this morning. So, Board of Commissioners, you have any questions? Uh, Vice Chairman Robinson. Yeah, just, just a couple, because I know we're tight on time. But real quick, and, and it's, it's obvious, I think most citizens that are either born here are those who migrated in, right? Um, the reality of where Douglas County is as it relates to its evolution. And when I look at it, I look at our sales tax as sort of a, uh, something I keep up with. And if you talk to your neighbors, um, and it depends on who you're talking to, a lot of our money leaves the county. We go outside the county to go to work, 8%, whatever the number is, pick, pick a number. 68% of the people move over to Atlanta uh, to have a, a higher paying job for whatever reason, and they come home. We're a bedroom community. And, and when I think through that, I'm like, okay, and I'm looking at my sales tax, money that we're driving here, but I'm like, but yeah, but a lot of money go outside this county. Uh, whether it's restaurants, I mean, I, at some point you get tired of Games and gumbos and you know San Marascos and, and so one of the challenges I've always heard um, is that there is a gap, right? In, in sort of retail, we got a lot of convenience stores, a lot of Dollar Generals, a lot. Of, let's just keep what this is, and we're lacking sort of that so that move up space. And so my question is, is that does it require a more concentrated effort? I mean, I appreciate the marketing, I appreciate the framework. Our development authority is, is, is designated to sort of the big stuff. Right, they, they, you know, they go big game hunting. But um, does it require a more dedicated person like the development authority that focuses on this? I appreciate the consultant, but I'm, I'm trying to say, but how do I, how do I accelerate that? I appreciate, uh, you said, what, 10 to 20% is the retail sector, but we know that 51% of all businesses are small. We're doing a, you know, sort of a, 
uh, entrepreneurship study uh, right now and it should be delivered here soon. And so <coughs> how, how, do we, how do we accelerate this? I mean, I, I get it, but, but how do we accelerate it? How do we, how do we incent uh, this on a higher level? Uh, because there is some needs, and again, we're going to get there over time, and I do understand demographics. I do understand household income is a lot of drive. I mean, I, that has a lot to do with it. I understand density. But I'm just curious, in the meantime, what can we do to be more concentrated to sort of <coughs> accelerate this? And that's one question I have. Uh, so I'm going to take a stab at answering it, um, and then Chris might want to jump in and um, say something as well. Uh, so we are an extension of the economic development efforts uh, guided by the authority who, of course, is guided by the community. Um, yes, a lot of the projects that, that Chris and his team are working on are going to be the, the, the large ones. But I would argue that a lot of the retail stuff is pretty big too, especially when you consider the additional tax revenue of sales tax if it falls into a category that's collected. You know, sale, there are no sales tax on unprepared food or groceries, and that's something that's actually a really big advantage for us citizens, <laughs> um, but it uh, turns into kind of an interesting dynamic since, again, food is really important, but restaurants are going to have the full freight of taxes. Um, space can be the, the big the game changer, I think. Um, is there a location that is affordable <laughs> for that business to start in, and understanding the parameters of where that business needs to be from a cost standpoint. Uh, in addition to that, most of those small businesses, having been a small business owner in the past, being in a small business right now, you know, you have a period of time where you you got to get it done and get it established. So understanding how um, the upfront cost can be minimized, um, how it can be accelerated. Uh, those are things that I think of from your perspective that can be helpful for any business. Um, always tell people. I mean, you know, part of marketing is the communication of that. These are the things that we're interested in. We believe they would work. Uh, here's why. And then the last part of that is just the fourth dimension. It, it just takes time. You just got to keep going and going and going. I heard uh, the, the mayor of uh, Decatur, the former mayor of Decatur the other day say that it was uh, Decatur was a 25 year overnight success <laughs> and I said that's a pretty good way to state it um, so it won't feel like it happened immediately but it will happen along, along a period of time and, and that's what I, I would say have a vision communicate that vision but build the flexibility into it to meet some of the market needs as those projects materialize around trying to fill those gaps as well and I would add to that 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 point that point there about the flexibility um, is, is really important so we've got you know a number of you know opportunities in the pipeline around Fairburn Road and a lot of those things are centered around you know the policies that are in place and trying to figure out how to maneuver through those things um, so that that's a very important part so these things are in the pipeline they're actively working but but as Andy said they do take time and then the other piece is, you know, when he talks about space, so we had a number of restaurants or, or what have you that wanted to be on Chapel Hill. But once you get past a certain point on Chapel Hill, Chapel Hill becomes no longer viable for them. And so there's a space constraint thing. So what that says to us is, all right, we need to create new market opportunities. And new market opportunities come with new land sites, and new land sites bring along new, you know, developable spaces. And so thus, we go back to the Lee Road Extension and why the Lee Road Extension is so important because it lays the groundwork for a new market, a new corridor. So those are the things I think are the things that really help drive these, uh, these opportunities are, are, are focusing on their, the, the, the permitting process, um, the approvals that, that are necessary in order to get things done, and then just the, the space you know, opportunities. We do have empty spaces, but some of those spaces are empty for a short reason. And so sometimes it's a matter of that space being in the right location um, in order for it to be viable. Okay. Can you hear that? Yes, ma'am. Oh, thank you so much. And Andy, I, I have permission to guide it next. I just wanted to just mention one thing. I know we mentioned, uh, Vice Chairman mentioned our median uh, household income. Actually, newly just released a, a report in December 2018. Our median household income now is 65000 which we're running with 
the cab full to the calm. So we're running with the big boys now, so we're just hoping that you could entice someone to at least fight, you know, with our areas. And I know uh, Commissioner Guider is going to have some comments about her area as well. So with no further ado, Commissioner Guider. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. Um, you didn't mention the mall. Uh, a lot of regional malls are being re revamped uh, to entice some more restaurants and uh, family-oriented things. Uh, would you touch on the mall? Sure. Are there any plans for? <laughs> <laughs> Can you say? It? Can you tell? It? <laughs> I figured you were just going to say, "Go ahead." <laughs> Um, yeah, so we, we, we're actively, actively engaged with CBL and looking at what the future opportunities you know, may be. Uh, they're very realistic about you know, who they are as a mall, what's happening with all of their assets um, across the country. And we actually had a meeting with them a few weeks ago um, to talk about that very thing. So whether it's not, it's not necessarily a part of those particular outlines, Andy has been engaged with us actually um, at the large retail show um, in uh, Las Vegas two weeks ago now, mm -hmm. yeah. they actually were able to sit down and meet and talk about some of those things. So um, things are, are in the works. Okay, and you also mentioned Post Road. And <laughs> out there we also have um, the problem about the three, eight, uh, I mean, the uh, three <coughs> acre minimum no, and mm -hmm. thing, and impervious surfaces and things like that. But uh, it seems like there's room for a little strip mall mm -hmm. uh, on one of those corners. Yeah. Uh, that would capture a lot of uh, people on the way yeah. home or going to work. And, um. There are definitely some possibilities <coughs> there. I uh, feel like the greatest opportunity would be to try to serve uh, in a, a larger way. Um, you know, again, going back to, I promise you, I don't think with my stomach all the time, uh, but when you start going back to food, you're trying to, you're trying to build in something that people are going to do very repeatably uh, and that they're going to spend time on. Uh, and we find that grocery anchored centers are really kind of, I mean, they are the overwhelming majority of shopping center developments in the country uh, for a reason. <clears throat> so trying to find that opportunity when, when it's ready. Uh, I, I agree there's some smaller uh, opportunities there. The challenge is getting someone to jump first um, and then, you know, building something new for a smaller business, an independent, maybe even a franchisee, uh, might be a little tough from an economic standpoint. But if the market cool. isn't, uh, if the market appears, or the you know, if you're looking a little bit further east, where there's, uh, I would say there's a little more synergy. And I don't mean that in a bad way. It just means that you have more, you have more uh, more choices. In, in that location as opposed to being uh, maybe a little bit more isolated. The district four goes all the way to the city limits of Villarica <coughs> and they're building inside Douglas County like another thousand homes out there in their life. Yep. And that's uh, in progress now. <coughs> so the rooftops, as you uh, talked about, is growing tremendously out there. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's been some, uh, a lot of um, warehousing type things that's gone in out there. We, we have a problem with the ramp there, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, Liberty Road's a little tight. But, uh, and also in, in my district is, uh, you know, we have a huge shopping center that's uh, half empty at least. Um, mm -hmm. No Walmart mm -hmm. is what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. And that's, to me, that's a very good location because people try to avoid Highway 5. <laughs> so they'll yeah. come in which way to avoid uh, the intersection at Highway 5. So, we, uh, um, we believe that <coughs> there are some opportunities there that are going to be uh, maybe a combination of, of some things. That's a big space. Um, and, and it seems like there, there's space for outlines, more outlines. So I don't know. Um, yeah, that, that, that's a really good point. Um, you know, when we talk about flexibility and being able to kind of not react per se, but just fill the, the need in the market. Uh, parking fields have really changed a lot over time. I mean, you, you know, we're used to seeing old, big, moonscape type frontage, and that has some really big opportunities for smaller independent developments in a one to two acre 
manner that can bring in a full service restaurant or something else that, that might be a, a desire in the community. And sometimes that requires some um, guidance and some assistance through the entitlement process is you know, have to kind of work through this doesn't dam damage the um, the parking requirement for the, the user. Uh, a lot of times the user is going to dictate that. Let's say it's in front of a Publix, for example, they're going to have as much say or more in whether or not that can even be done. Uh, but then they've got to come in and the developer or the, who, whoever owns the property wants to <coughs> seek some advice and guidance from the whoever the entitled, entitling entity mm -hmm. is, whether it's city, county, or... But I just wondered if there was anything in the making over the mall. Because <laughs> I do know some stores closed. Uh, they, um, we had a really good meeting with them. <coughs> and um, uh, they're, very, um, they're very interested in keeping that as a very viable location and understand the importance of the community. I, I would say <laughs> you have a very good partner there, which is really, really important. Um, they, they own it. They operate it. And they've got a history of working with those types of properties so um, had it been in the hand of a unknown investor that might have been a little more of something to be concerned about but I feel very comfortable with the owner of that I think they're going to be very comfortable talking to us and when there's something to discuss I think they really want to get out in front of it and talk to everyone okay. yes Maybe we can or can't answer this question about the mall. The mall, there's been some, some things <coughs> happening at the mall. Uh, is it public or is it um, kind of within the realm of the development authority and like you guys working from within? That's my, and then I got a follow up question with it. Yeah, um, as, as far as things going, I mean, I know they're working on, we had our, our meeting a few weeks ago talking about, you know, upkeep of the property. Uh, they're currently in the process of installing a new roof. There's no change of changing of hands. Uh, there's no change in, there's okay. no changing of hands. Okay, okay, yeah. okay, okay. Um, okay, the other but my my bigger question of that is how are you guys balancing um, uh, the old brick and mortar, you know, big boxes versus looking at a new possibility of a big box going in somewhere with some hopefully developed land or undeveloped land west, mm -hmm. hypothetically. So how are you guys balancing that to kind of you know most of us would say, why don't you just fill the big box then to come to us asking for a rezoning of some sort to kind of fit another big box elsewhere. So uh, that's driven by the investors a lot of times. Um, you'll, uh, you'll have people that create those developments and make those investments mm -hmm. to, get that, to get their return, whatever that may be. Uh, so that would be why uh, your neighborhood anchored grocery center would go greenfield as opposed to taking that old location. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, the old location doesn't present to the developer any opportunity to make money. <laughs> right. So we, we have to put ourselves in their shoes um, as well as we think through this because that's how we're going to be successful. Well, we're talking about the two business right. solutions we're trying to create. Mm -hmm. One is the value to the real estate investor. And then, of course, the other is going to be the ability for that to, uh, store to open and solve what they want to achieve, whether well, that's I just want to make selling sure that groceries or entertainment for the family and the kids. Um, <clears throat> what we find is there's a baked in affordability in an existing center mm -hmm. that is often not in a new one. Mm -hmm. um, and that brings a different set of tenants to the table. Yes. Uh, and those are the, that's, that's the opportunities we try to identify. I understand. And I know you can't control it. I'm just kind of curious as to kind of what are you guys, strategically, how are you guys looking at that? Yeah. Right. So, I mean, we talked about those entertainment opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they're almost always looking for an existing space right. because they know going ground up probably not going to work very well right. for the economics of what they can afford based on what the revenue of that business is. Because they look at yield. Yeah, I get it. I get so it. what we do is we would say, well, here are your opportunities for that. Where, uh, so you're sharing it all. You're sharing, uh, yeah. you're sharing it all so they can kind of uh, see it all. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. But, but the balancing act is kind of however they decide to go based on the yield, based on the cost, based on, yeah. you know, trying to either ground up or existing in. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, you spoke about a 12 or 20 percent, um, uh, these numbers that you guys see, you know, are these local numbers, state numbers, national numbers, or regional numbers that you guys just spoke up about, these numbers of 12 or 20 percent? Um, so, I don't have the number memorized for Douglas County, forgive me, but 
just about every one of them I've ever looked at from the state of Georgia. Okay, they, so do the state their, they do their state numbers okay, per county. Okay, okay. Almost every one of them I've ever looked at <coughs> all on the on the absolute lowest side would be, you know, in that low teens and then sometimes on a high side. The numbers right. look good, they look kind of interesting, but I just want to make sure that the general public know that these are not No, they're not they're, they're not they're not just local numbers <laughs> here and it looks like, you know, we got all this you know possibilities or not but uh, i just okay good enough so yeah. they're, they're regional or whatever state georgia department of labor and there you go for the county good enough. good enough now the challenging i, I think uh, if i'm hearing and seeing this correctly the challenging the challenges is going to be you now we got the brick and mortar and we got the internet now mm -hmm. so that combination deal now is kind of not saying it's putting the brick and mortar out of business because you just share with me that that's not the case but that millennial is looking probably more of that internet usage. And I think we'll probably find in this room, you know, 80, 90% of us will probably go online to buy certain things, not all things, mm -hmm. but there are quite a few things that we, we kind of take a look at and find that it might be cheaper to, to kind of do that, right? And you might set us, you might kind of skip some, some kind of tax sanction of some sort. <laughs> not that it's legal, uh, yeah, not, not the legality side of it, but. And I but, believe Georgia is looking a little bit more tightly at that as a state. Oh, I know. Yes, they are. That, yes, our legislators are. Yeah. But what I'm, but leading up to my question though is, how are you guys kind of assuring those types of challenges when you deal with brick and mortar and you're dealing with the internet side of things because that's kind of where we're losing, even that's mm -hmm. lost, Penny, uh, quite a few other things that we just kind of somewhat uh, the state is working on it, but we have to live with because we can't control it. We don't have a mechanism in place not to control. And, and Georgia is an interesting state. We work all we, we work all over the country, but primarily in you know the the Sun Belt and a few states in the Midwest. Mm -hmm. um, and Georgia, like a few of the neighboring states, have a very centralized way that sales tax is collected through the Department of Revenue. Mm -hmm. Uh, where some other neighboring states collect all of it locally and then they send that up to the state. So the state share comes through the municipality or the county. Either way you look at it, uh, it just presents some limitations on how that revenue could be utilized because you don't necessarily know until it comes. That's exactly right. It, it takes a while to get back down to the community instead of coming through the community up. Well, that, that's what we do. A lot of times we miss it too, though. Yeah, okay. and we may not know uh, now. Exactly right. Uh, you know, not to get into the state politics too much, but the, the state understands, and they're I think they're starting to be more uh, conducive to requests from the community. Uh, of course, it has to be you know non-disclosed and things like that because of the way that sales tax revenue mm -hmm. is reported or sales revenue sales revenue is reported to the state. Mm -hmm. um, in a little bit of a different manner. All right, we got way down the lead. Yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Let me get back to the to answer your question. Yes. Um, so, the business oftentimes wants a pickup window if it's food because of convenience, mm -hmm. uh, and oftentimes they want a uh, pickup lane mm -hmm. if it's uh, a non food related item, but something where you could order it over the internet. Walmart, notably, the one that's kind of gone through the biggest <coughs> transformation of this before. Uh, I bought a TV on walmart.com okay. standing in the store right. because it was ten dollars cheaper <laughs> same here and i hung around, around for 20 same, minutes same way, yeah. and i walked 20 feet over to the pickup window and picked up my tv for twenty dollars less yes um but it was sold out of that store mm -hmm. so i don't believe we, we run much risk with that um you know a lot of Food services have got, you know, they've got apps. I bet many people in the room have the Chick-fil-A app on their phone. Uh, you know, just mm -hmm. stuff like that. Um, you know, the technology is just making it a little bit easier for people to have a better experience, or is that word, mm -hmm. again, uh, that people want to, you know, they want to kind of do it in a way that they feel like is very convenient and interacts in the way that they want to do it. Panera has kiosks. You go in there, you don't even have to talk to anybody. If you want to buy a cup of coffee, you can go and pay mm -hmm. for it, pick up the coffee, and then just do your thing. And, that, that, and they recognize that as part of their success. And, and I'm not saying that the, the brick and mortar is, is mm -hmm. going to totally go away with you. Right. I think they'll become more of a distribution center <coughs> versus right. a store front. Uh, Smaller spaces, more than correct. likely. Yeah. Uh, so that, sh that could present some challenges. I think Kohl's, and I don't know if this Kohl's falls into the bucket, but Kohl's and Planet Fitness have been nationally talking about you know taking a fitness space out of cutting part of that out of the Coles building right. 
Right. Not here. I don't right. Know. I, 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 I can ask you. So, and I just wanted to be said so we can kind of understand that, that, I mean, if you're looking 20 years down the road, you, you can kind of think along these lines because that, that next consumer is thinking along that, that line. They're, they're not looking for, uh, they're looking to, to ride their bikes there. They're looking to go online with their apps there. They're, they're not the average consumer that would go to a brick and mortar. I'm not saying that's going to go away. I thought the same thing about the movie industry, uh, the theater industry, that it would go away when all these other ways of looking at a movie came about. But somehow, people still want to go and eat popcorns in front of a big screen. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. uh, not as much. Yeah, so, um, but with that, let me move on to the other stuff. I know we've got a long day here, though. But Chris, don't you don't you have a team of uh, retail a retail team that <coughs> focuses in on the big box retail type format or from the economic development side of things. Yes, he's, oh, he's, okay. He is our team. Okay, yeah. okay, gotcha. Yeah. We, we, we are a team. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. And, and, and just so you know, this is a partnership, so it's a, it's, it's a Douglas County Economic Development Authority and City of Douglasville right. uh, Development right. Authority partnership that basically are you know, funding this. And it's, uh, and it's also supported through Georgia Power. But as Andy mentioned, he is, he is an extension of the team. So yeah. we're not, it's not a, it's like he, he goes and does it and then we come back and he goes and finds a fish and then we try and do this. He's working the whole thing. Yeah, okay, okay, because I, I thought that was something in place and realized mm -hmm. Andy was, was that team. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Last but not least, uh, the Highway 92 bypass, that whole project that's kind of coming together. I think there's going to be many opportunities that are there, so I'm assuming working, and I do the same with the uh, City of Douglasville and the Mayor Council and those guys, and kind of what the future master plan of that whole makeup looks like from Paulding County all the way in to 20. So I'm assuming you guys are kind of have those same kind of conversations, those ongoing conversations, because when it when it become reality is when that 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 road opens up. Mm -hmm. We. Um we keep a very close eye on that yeah. and have actually already pitched that over to a couple of folks that were looking for some opportunities uh, in that neighborhood kind of convenience based space right. trying to fill what we believe is uh, a need for food in the in the area uh, in the north of town mm -hmm. uh, 92 ch I mean that that road changes some things oh um, yes so uh, that is you know, you know, that is, yeah. why Chick-fil-A doubled down there. You yeah. got the old racetrack across the street, yep. which has mm -hmm. some activity. Mm -hmm. um, we've got a second location of another store coming. I need to just let them make their announcement, but right. uh, you know, it's moved through um, <coughs> some processes with the city right. uh, as well. So there, you know, and there's more to come. I mean, there's uh, stuff on both sides of the road leading right. to 20. Um, I think our challenge there is how do we get it further north? Because yeah. uh, right. I think from you know where the uh, uh, where the new route and the old route come together, <laughs> right, right there. I think there's a CBS in that intersection. Mm -hmm. uh, so further down, it, 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 yeah, from there north. So, oh, oh, north. Oh, no, 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 sorry, uh, right here now, right down, I guess in downtown. So north there, and then it'd be kind of I southeast to the right. Right. Uh, I feel like that area north of that all the way up to where it connects with the existing 92 route headed into calling that that's probably the harder nut to crack right because um, that's where that's where the greater need of those residency in that area exactly. you know coming out of Paulding County coming through is and, and, and the case we have to make there is that um, while there is some development and some home growth household mm -hmm. growth going on there it's just not as strong as uh, some other areas that people might have been working with we have to, you know, we just have to make sure we're sharp on that. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but the good news is we've, we've, we've had some interest. Yeah. Um, cool. Again, you know, it's gonna, it takes a little time. Because it becomes overnight, not, 25 years. Yeah, the conversation I've been, Chris, you might know this, but there's looked to be a, a shopping plaza where possible mm -hmm. shopping plaza up near the, um, the, yeah. the, the service station, the, the mobile home, and all that kind of good stuff. So mm -hmm. um, don't know how deep that, you know, how deep they're in or, you know. But the conversation is being had at this point. Yeah. yeah, we need about an eight to twelve acre site of mm -hmm. that way that has the right geometry and it's right. developable. I mean, you know, these are all things that are just good to hear. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so when someone comes in and says we're interested, uh, how can we get to yes? Mm -hmm. Again, the no go, no, uh, no go, no go decision and the financial side of that. I mean, you know, there may be some things that present itself as a, a way to help them get to the point of being able to move forward with the project. Um, 
again, you know, visioning and mm -hmm. saying we'd like for it to look like this. Mm -hmm. You know, how do y'all feel about it? And is right. there some way to kind of tweak it so it works for everyone? Andy's going um, presenting to the um, council work session at four this good. afternoon as well. Good, good, good. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, okay. I appreciate it, Andy. Yeah. Good job. Praise good job. I yield back. Thank you so much, Commissioner Mitchell. Commissioner McCarthy? Although this Commissioner Mitchell took up most of my time, <laughs> most of my questions, I will ask this one a very brief question. What are you looking at as far as entertainment? <coughs> a lot of times, we, the families, yeah. especially in my area, we go outside of Douglasville. So, top golf, um, shoots, those types of mm -hmm. entertainment venues. Are yeah. any of those on the horizon in Douglas County? Yeah. yeah. I would say yes, and uh, we're a little early into that component mm -hmm. on a few. Uh, we did meet with someone in, in uh, at the Vegas convention uh, specifically in the space uh, of an entertainment option that would keep your money in, in town. <laughs> um, and you know, I I, I call them more uh, adult oriented, not. You know, I'm going to be careful how I say it, but right. Um, they're family friendly, but you know, when you go to a Top Golf, uh, the restaurant and the bar are a very big component of their business. Uh, so I, I don't normally see a whole lot of youngsters running around there, but you will often see, you know, your teenage and, and, and up. Uh, but it's also a corporate thing too, so you have a lot of folks entertaining business clients and, and things there too. Uh, we have places where those can work, uh, and uh, we have a few uh, trampoline parks, a couple of other things that uh, are looking for Atlanta locations, and we're positioning Douglasville as one of those. So we, we'd really like to see something like that come. We have some spaces we feel that would be a natural plug and play. So, uh, and they like that too, because then they can move forward with some certainty. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Commissioner Parker. But thank you so much, uh, Chris and Andy, for coming in with this presentation. I'm quite sure it was quite enlightening uh, for our Board of Commissioners. So thank you, and we appreciate you coming in and uh, fulfilling my request today. Uh, I appreciate all the time, too. Thank you. It's very yeah. helpful to be here. Thank you. Well, Board of Commissioners, we have an addition. Uh, we have uh, Mr. Charles Branson, who had, uh, that he's here today, and I de certainly wanted to oblige and give him an opportunity to speak about the Kids Home Initiative and uh, he's here and uh, certainly we didn't have it on our uh, agenda but I did add it to allow him since he had come this far. We certainly don't want to turn him around this morning and we appreciate you coming in Mr. Branson, uh, Mr. Charles Branson and I believe you have some other guests so that you, you can introduce your guests. Yeah, yeah thank you Madam Chairman. I'm Charles Brantz, and I'm the uh, I'm with the Douglas County Homeless Coalition and the Atlanta Regional Commission on Homeless Homelessness. I'd like to say we've got a little I've got a little continuity with the young man who just made his presentation. Uh, I sold shoes working my way through college, but the hot items were go-go boots. Uh, <laughs> I know that went over my commissioner's head, but uh, but uh, it was there. Uh, so more than a few years ago. Uh, the school system added uh, a homeless liaison in our school system, uh, Jill Smith, and uh, immediately I started getting phone calls about looking for resources to help homeless school children and, and school ch children whose families were facing homelessness. Uh, at about that time, 2014-2015, United Way was starting uh, the Kids Home Initiative to work uh, with the liaisons to to uh, address kids' homelessness, and we lobbied with them to get Douglas County added to that effort. And since then, I believe uh, one thing: the phone call stopped because uh, resources were there to address these needs. And uh, I think you'll find that the results of this effort over the years have been have been fantastic. Unfortunately, last fall, I was told that they were taking <coughs> Kids Home Initiative out of Douglas County because there just hadn't been local resources supporting it. And uh, we, we were getting help from United Way and we were getting help from the Seamer Foundation. And uh, the Douglas County Homeless Coalition lobbied to have that continued. And they continued it for another six months and now we're 
trying to raise the, the basic, uh, very basic funding necessary to continue it going forward. So we were looking at, at trying to get uh, uh, a minimum of $10,000 a year uh, ongoing to keep this great initiative going. I've got with me uh, Darlene Dukes with Sweetwater Mission, um, Jill Smith with the Homeless Liaison, Melanie Kagan, the Regional um, United Way, uh, Leanne Champion is the chairperson of the Douglas County Homeless Coalition, and I'm introducing to uh, make the presentation Amy Barrow, Director of Homelessness for United Way of Metro Atlanta. Amy? Thanks. Um, so, uh, thank you for squeezing us in. I really appreciate it. And I talk really fast, so if you need me to slow down, just raise your hand or something. Amy, um, for the record, if you could give, give us your full name for the clerk. So sure. I am Amy Barrow. I'm the Director of Homelessness at United Way, and I'm actually a Douglas County resident. I'm working with this room. Thank you. Welcome. Yes. Hope to see some stuff on Lee Road. <coughs> um, I'm going to pass out some of these if y'all want to kind of pass them down. It's just a little bit more information because I know the PowerPoints can be wordy and again I talk fast I'm going to cover a lot of things. I didn't know we were going to have a full house. I didn't bring enough so sorry about that. Um, okay go. Great. So as Charlie mentioned I am from uh, the homeless or I'm here with the homelessness liaison at Douglas County Jill Smith and we are here to talk to you today about um, our family homelessness crisis in Douglasville. So I think that when a lot of people think of homelessness you're probably thinking of an individual on the street Maybe he's panhandling around Thornton Road or living under a bridge. And while we know that's a visible um, kind of cue of homelessness, what we're seeing in this county is an uptick of family homelessness. Um, and so Jill provided us some great numbers from the school. So we know that 682 children and their parents have come to the school in this school year and said, we are experiencing a housing crisis. We are either living in a motel, we are doubled or tripled up with other family members. We are homeless. We do not have our own roof over our head. And I think Jill can also give us some background that we think that number is actually higher. Those are just the folks that have um, made the decision to come forward and give us that information. Some folks keep that a little bit you know, tight, closer to the chest because they're afraid they might lose their children if they admit they're having a housing crisis. So what we're working to do um, in partnership with Sweetwater Mission is find those families, find those children, and keep them in their school of origin while at the same time working with their parents to find a housing solution in Douglas County that's affordable, safe, um, so they don't lose any school time, so they get all the benefits of, of being housed. We know that when a child misses um, school, you know, if they're moving from school to school, bouncing to find cheaper rent or to find another place to live, they're losing on average about three months of learning. So think about if you do that once or twice or three times a year, you're going back a full, a full school year without even realizing it. Um, we know these issues continue to compact, and this is what's kind of perpetuating that cycle of homelessness or that cycle of um, very low poverty. Um, Jill, did you want to add anything about the number in the current state right now? Okay. okay. You, know, you can always jump in. Um, and we know that there's a lot of great work going on in Douglas County in terms of homelessness, and so we're not saying this is the only answer. We know this is a big problem that has lots and lots of solutions, but we know that it's kind of only going to work if we implement every available solution. And so we're afraid that if we lose this program, we're taking away one of those key solutions to, to address that family <coughs> homelessness issue. Um, so Kids Home Initiative, I'm just going to give you a, a quick, and, um, quick version of what it is. It is a program where we work with families for 12 entire months at a minimum. We have a few that we work for a little bit longer. And we are supporting uh, that family starting with the child. So our child is our primary client. We find that child at school age that is presented to Jill and her team that has a housing crisis. We connect them with case management, Linda, over there at Sweetwater Mission, so she's our, our case management guru. Um, she's going to do some intake, interview that family, find out what the income is, um, do they have a job, do they have benefits, if they don't, how can we bridge that, how can we help them, are they applying for um, food stamps, they are applying for TANF, are they getting <coughs> child support if there's a situation where not both the parents are in the household, um, do they need a more steady income. Um, Linda will help them with some job leads, uh, get their resume together, we send that over to Breezy and work for Workforce Development, try to get some more income coming in. And then Linda's going to help them look for housing. So she actually does housing inspections with our clients. She goes to make sure that the apartment or the home that they're moving into is safe, is stable, um, that there's a lease, um, it's in good standing, and that the kids are going to be able to stay in that school of origin, because again, we think that's really important. Once they've moved on from housing, um, they then get the opportunity to work with our team to set some goals. So we know that there's a lot of things that our family, all the way from the adults to the children that have been putting off, 
because they've been in this constant state of crisis and struggle. So we find that a lot of our families, if they just had a vehicle, they might be able to get to work more timely or more consistently. If they just had finished their college degree or even got their high school diploma, they might be able to make more money on average um, hourly that they've been putting off getting physicals or preventative health care uh, appointments. All those things are some goals that our families can select and then get uh, a goal coach that works with them for six full months, is kind of um, available to them once a week to help them progress to that goal. When our families achieve that goal, we even give them an additional incentive of $100 a month if they can prove to us they accomplish that goal, just to keep them, um, reinforce those good habits and kind of help them create a little bit of savings. We encourage them to take that money, maybe open a savings account for a rainy day, that kind of thing. Um, once our families have accomplished some goals, we then encourage them as they're on their journey to self sufficiency to give back, uh, to be able to talk to new families coming into the program, to do some community service work. We really see this program as a full return on investment. We want to take our families that are struggling, make them full-fledged working citizens, paying their taxes, but then also have the ability to give back and help the next kind of family and generation coming through. So that's our three-step process. I'm going to skip through these. This is what I said. Um, so we have been working. We had a pilot um, for about half the year in 2015, right, where we served 10 families. Um, and then uh, that went really well, so we secured some funding. So the full program actually started in 2016 to today. So these are some of our um, wonderful accomplishments that really owe uh, Linda and uh, Darlene a great round of uh, thanks for that. We have to date housed 103 families. So these were 103 families that, again, were either doubled and tripled up, living in a shelter, living in a hotel, and now they are paying their own rent, they are leased up, um, they are stably housed. That breaks down to about 379 folks total. Now this does not include folks that may already be in a stable housing situation but are just looking to Linda for some case management support. So they might come into the program because they're behind on the utility payment but they're not you know, homeless. But they do need that additional case management support. Linda does provide that. So she will, again, help them with their budgeting, resume, refer them to our healthcare provider, that kind of stuff. So we actually see a little bit more on families than this. Um, so that's kind of our, our breakdown by year, if you can see that slide. I think one of the most important uh, for me, when we look at these numbers, is that of those numbers, only nine families in the course of the <coughs> three and a half years have um, since been evicted or left their permanent housing. So that's about an 88% success rate, which is um, very high for this kind of work. The national average um, for best practices is about 75, so we're a little bit higher than that. So uh, we're really proud of that. Um, I know Charlie mentioned we're looking for some money, so I thought I'd just throw it out there. This is the total program budget. So this is what we spend on average a year to serve 35 families. So we are serving, or we are spending about $135,000 a year. This includes everything. This includes that we're paying for health care appointments, that we're giving incentives um, for transportation vouchers, that we're paying that housing, those upfront costs, um, those utility expenses, all those things. So this is kind of the full budget. Um, if you have any questions about that, I'd be glad to answer them. Um, that was super quick. Did I miss anything up in here really fast? No? Okay. Um, I do also have one more little handout that I'll pass around. Um, obviously, I'm going to sit up here and say the program is great, right? It pays my salary. I love to do it. But we did collect some information from some of the families that are actually in the program. And so these are just their own words of what the program has meant to them. So there's kind of three different things if you want to just pass them around and look at them. But um, I will make myself and the team available for questions. Do you have any? Okay. Board of Leadership and questions on Vice Chairman Robinson. Uh, yes, thank you, Madam Chair. <coughs> again, um, we'll be very brief because, again, we've got a long day today. Yes. Um, all right. So, and again, um, thank you, Charles, for being here. Charles Branson was one of the first people I met when I first came on. Um, in the office in 09. He was on one of my first district dialogues and got to know him over time and put teeth in everybody along the way from United Way, except for back then. Uh, at the same point in 2010, uh, Commissioner Mitchell probably in the door somewhere, but he also um, came on board to help me deal with homelessness. We did a challenge between, um, at that time, the chairman and the city mayor about putting money up for homelessness. I think the challenge was about $10,000 between each municipality. So this is something that I've always kept my mind uh, been aware of um, and, and sort of advocating behind the scenes but, but being consistent about the work that I've been doing here. Um, that being said, fast forward 10 years later, here we are. Um, so you're asking for $10,000. Let me ask you a question. Uh, what is the school system doing by way of, of supporting this? I'm just 
I'm curious. I, I'm, just, I'm mm -hmm. trying to bridge the gap with the sources. Are you meaning financially? Yeah. We're going to do some fundraisers. I mean, it's this is a housing initiative, not necessarily educational, so we have to focus yeah. through fundraising. I've got to. Thin line. Okay. okay. Um, all right. So, in, in my mind, um, we do have a homelessness challenge here. I wouldn't say problem, but it's a, it's a challenge, and it's going to continue to grow. Uh, perhaps as we have density, uh, we know we have a huge mental health um, issue that's growing here um, in Douglas County, uh, and so uh, it's continuous. Um, one of the things I, um, this board of commissioners, which I always appreciate both in the, in the prior and the current, was that we um, appropriated fifty thousand um, dollars for mental health. It was pretty broad appropriations, meaning any category dealing with suicide, you name it, and we. Um, well, um, we, we, we awarded, the past few years, we awarded it to a, uh, one firm, CORE, was sort of the facilitator, and they would award it to people who were grassroots to help facilitate whatever the issue was, so three nonprofits, etc. cetera. Um, I'm sitting here thinking, well, um, that hasn't been awarded this year, though we used it to help facilitate CSB um, and filling in the gap, and Jennifer um, confirmed that for me. Uh, but I, I'm thinking that perhaps you could work with CSB, or I, I'm, I'm trying to figure this out, uh, because um, while we allowed that appropriation to go over to CSB, that was only just sort of a one-time thing. This is something I think will be appropriate <coughs> for that funding, and we hadn't identified anybody this year because we were revamping that, but um, as a source, um, and I would think that that mental health um, appropriation that this board has awarded uh, could be um, a source of that. But I think what you're doing is, 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 is well needed. You've got to continue to work together. Mm -hmm. I don't think we can feel the whole bogey, though. I think your fundraising efforts are going to be very needed. Um, but at least um, $10,000 is what we did 10 years ago. I'm, I'm sure that that's something we could, at least I would support. So I you back, aren't you? Thank you so much, Vice Chairman Robinson. Uh, Commissioner Guider? Yes, ma'am. And I don't know who to address this to. Uh, now, United Way supports this? Yes, ma'am. And so you get grants from United Way for mm -hmm. most of your funds. Mm -hmm. And they are pulling it from Douglas County? Is that what you So um, the program comes from two main funding sources. One is the Seymour Family Foundation and then United Way. Seymour? So this, yes, the Seymour Family Foundation is pulling the funding for this year. Okay. It's a national uh, Yes. It's out of Ohio, yes. Okay, but are they pulling it from Douglas County? Is that what you said? Yes. Yes. They're so not going to, they won't renew it in uh, 2020. Is it unless you have local funding? Yes. So yes. the $10,000 is yes. to show them that the community supports you. Yes, ma'am. Yes. So, uh, but you're not asking for the 135 or whatever. No. <laughs> unless you have it in your pocket. <laughs> you just wanna, you know, <laughs> we'll take it. We wouldn't say no. Yeah. Get Ms. Commissioner uh, <laughs> Robinson to write you a check. Yes. <laughs> A-M-Y? <laughs> but uh, I just wanted to understand the logistics of it because I heard you say that uh, I, I see the United Way emblem here mm -hmm. and they fund part of it. Yes. And then the Seymour uh, yes, Foundation, they uh, do another part. Yes. And the schools, do they support you in any manner? Yeah, so the Homeless Liaison is where we get our direct referrals from, so Jill's very instrumental. She lets us know that families have been vetted, that they actually, you know, have a housing crisis, that they do have children in the schools in our area. Um, so she provides those referrals and um, assists with case management. I, I'm kind of surprised at the low number for some reason. Uh, when you said uh, 37 last mm -hmm. year, uh, and that's countywide. You're saying that. So we're in uh, the Lithia Springs and the Douglas County um, high schools and their feeder patterns, yes. So these are stably housed families. Yeah. They're stable. Right. So they're not a, a band-aid But you work with the school yeah. system for yes. all schools here in Douglas County. Lithia Springs and Douglas County high schools and all their feeders. Oh, just those? Yes. Those two. We initially identified Lithia Springs feeder system mm -hmm. as the, the um, the most in need right. of these services um, and, and did that originally if I can add about mm -hmm. the grants the original grant was that whatever we raised in Douglas County was matched by United Way mm -hmm. and then that money was taken to Seymour that right. matched it again yeah. mm -hmm. so we, we certainly 
want to get back in the good graces of the Seymour Foundation uh, for those efforts. Um, I would like to add one thing, uh, Commissioner Guider, if I may, is that one of the magical things about this is because we're helping people, we don't have people lining up that we have to screen. They're identified by Jill Smith with how these kids are performing in school and the other indicators, or we may refer individuals to Jill. So it's, it's wonderfully targeted, and that's why we've been able to get the kind of results we have uh, with the resources available. So uh, within 12 months, they're set to be <coughs> or stable. Yes. You, you, you said. Now we also, uh, the Douglas County Homeless Coalition, through various donors, also um, has, been has been the mm -hmm. primary contributor over the years. Uh, for this, and we're going to continue to do that. You and I worked together for many, many years on yes, the Character Coalition Board, and I remember after our breakfast, you took the excess food that we had over to the homeless little villages and things like that. And Actually, I was lobbying with you to get one of the very first uh, presentations about the Kids Home <laughs> Initiative to the uh, um, to our, our board. Right. And unfortunately, I think about that time, uh, that effort was discontinued. I mean, the, the but right, but right now, you've got most of your support. But if you have local support, mm -hmm. then that will keep those people on board. Yes. Right. Yes. yes. So, and you're asking ten thousand dollars, and you think this is going to be a ten thousand dollars per year? Yes. Request. Yes. Maybe. We would. Yeah, we would definitely like Maybe to see a multi-year. Um, just, you know, so the program doesn't, again, abruptly end. And year. you do work with the Community Service Board, do you not? No, we haven't yet, no. Because they do housing and things like that, too, so you might could collaborate on, on some of this stuff. All right. I just wanted to get it clear in my head mm -hmm. exactly what yes. was happening here. Yeah. I get that. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Commissioner Dyer. Um, anybody else have any questions about Commissioner Carlton? So, can you briefly tell us what will happen if you don't get the local match? What, what will happen to the program? Right, so if we don't get the local match, we would not have enough uh, funding to continue the program. Um, if you look at kind of the budget, we kind of would have to make some choices of what to cut, uh, down to maybe the bare bones of just doing housing. And the way our funding is looking right now, uh, we might get house maybe five families next year. Uh, we are spending about an average of $2,000 to house a family. Um, and then um, with the full program, so if you're talking about health care and all the additional incentives, we spend probably closer to 3000 or even $3,500 per family. So I think that might help answer your question about, you know, the number of why the, the family number looks kind of low. But it, obviously it's expensive. I mean, remember, you know, moving into your first apartment or home, all those upfront costs, that's what we're assisting these families with paying for. Um, often it's first and last month's rent and that kind of thing. Yeah. Also, I wanted to add too. That's the number of families. Often there's four children, five mm -hmm. children. That's, yes, that's, we're, we're saying families. Yes, in those numbers. So that's another reason. Mm -hmm. Right. <coughs> they are very large families. Usually, we're seeing families that are kind of going to jail as kind of the last result re resort. Mm -hmm. You know, the other kind of things that are in place in the county just don't work for them because the families are so large, or because there's an eviction or a credit issue on the record. Um, so those are kind of the families that we're working with and lifting up. It's another reason why it does take a full 12 months to get someone stable because it does take a long time to get over, you know, an eviction or a detrimental credit score. Um, so those are all the kind of things that we're addressing. <coughs> and often these families have, you know, a very high risk um, assessments on their rent, so rent is even higher for them um, than it might be for, the, you know, the average person. Yeah. There are other local fundraising efforts as well. Yes. Um, so I'm the regional director for the Ford County region. <coughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, United Way. Okay. Yeah. So we actually do fundraise in Douglas County um, for other efforts that United Way funds and things that we provide um, resources for. So we do have some requests in the works with some of the companies that are in Douglas County to see if they would be willing to help support as well. Um, those are just not as quick um, uh, there's a lot that goes into some of those requests and sometimes it takes a few months for us to actually get to a point where they'll accept those requests um, but it is on our it is on our working agenda to continue to support this program with the companies locally as well so we're not just coming to the Commission we are going around to make sure that the community knows it's here and supports it could you state your name for the record please Melody Kagan United Way of Greater Atlanta okay. 
Are we, sure. excuse me, are we, are you, is she part this of This is Linda Van, she is yeah, our Linda, case manager. Okay, well, come on up. Yeah, Linda. we came with a big okay, group, so. <laughs> <laughs> we should have requested extra microphones. <laughs> Linda, please come forward. What's your full name, Linda? Linda Van, and I'm the case manager. And I just wanted to point out, you look at the numbers, but every year I get 60 to 80 referrals that don't get housed. One, because we don't have enough money to house them, and two, they're at such a rock bottom level, it's, they, they don't have jobs or transportation, and I try to spend the money wisely to give the families that have the best shot of succeeding. So I have to make decisions sometimes and say, I'm sorry, I just can't make this pro report for you. But I also wanted to add one note about the cost if this program does not continue. Atlanta was just named the fourth largest growing metropolitan in our nation, metropolitan area in our nation. And I guarantee you all the people that are coming into Atlanta are not going to live in Atlanta city limits. Harvard and Apartments.com did a study where suburban areas have grown by 159% in the last 10 years. So we're going to have a lot of these people coming into Douglas County. And um, so they're coming into suburbia and they've got to have a car, car insurance, car maintenance to get a job because I've worked with these families and if they have any reason that they have to be out because of health or child care issues or whatever, after four days they probably don't have that job. So uh, if their car breaks down, there's not enough transportation, so there's a lot of issues involved in homeless families that we're trying to address and we've gotten partners out there that will help with cars and furniture and things like that but I just want to say the cost of not having this problem you're going to see a cost in your law enforcement because of arrest and uh, things like that violations are going to go up uh, homelessness breaks up families I have single moms that have put their fa their children with their grandparents, et cetera, and uh, trying to get it settled so that they can get their children back to home with them. And so it breaks up families. There's an increase of violence, an increase of addictions to alcohol and substances. There's um, abuse that, that, that grows. And of course, we've talked about the impact of children. So there's a huge cost out there in your social services. The cost of carrying those on for Douglas County will be increasing as more people move in and might need those services. So just overall, um, like you take a homeless person that has a hospital stay, uh, they usually have to stay four days longer than someone who is housed because they have waited till the last minute to have to go to the hospital. And it's usually a cost of about $4,800 more for that person for them to stay. And as far as mental health issues, um, it, it's a tremendous cost there to depression, anxiety, a lot of different uh, mental health issues start cropping up as a homeless person. So I just wanted to add those in, that there is going to be a cost to the county if we don't do this. And we're just looking sort of at the tip of the iceberg here for Douglas County and a lot of other counties. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. thank, thank you so much. We appreciate your addition to the conversation. Thank you. Did you hear back? Okay, thank you all so much for this presentation. It was wonderful. It certainly uh, enlightened uh, this board. This board. This, uh, certainly uh, we appreciate the awareness and I'd like to think optimistically pos uh, positive at all times. So to just uh, make the statement that we will possibly, this uh, Kids Home Initiative will be leaving that this county is is an understatement for me because I believe that we, 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 we do the right thing here in Douglas County and we certainly just don't want this to fall on deaf ears. So we're enthusiastic uh, about your presentation today and we'll just discuss a little further. So I don't want to make any promises, but I just uh, will guarantee you that we do take care of our citizens here. If I can say one thing, yes. you know, we'll take into consideration. This is the only program that Douglas County has that puts the child first. Yes. The key component for referral to this organism, to the Kids Home Initiative, is that they have a child that attends Douglas County School System. Mm -hmm. That child has to be a, a student in our school to receive a referral. Yes. Okay. 
So um, if y'all would just keep that in consideration. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Thank for you for giving us some time. Thank you. Absolutely. We're going to move on uh, to tomorrow. We have a proclamation on the proclamations. It's proclaiming June 8, 2019 as a Family Health and Fitness Day in Douglas County. And that will be uh, rendered by our own um, uh, Director Gary Dukes. So I know you'll be prepared tomorrow to make that proclamation. We have one addition to our business item that I will uh, place at the top uh, before we get to tab number five. Uh, we have uh, a crease and an increase for attorney position. Uh, there's an increase in, in the budget. And uh, we had our own Sonya Compton here this morning, our solicitor. Is she here? She stepped out. She stepped out. Okay. Let's ask her for more so she can make a presentation to the board. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Podium. Can you? Thank you, um, solicitor. We appreciate you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good, Good morning. morning. This is my first time being here. Uh, so I don't know what I'm doing, but I'll do the best I can. Okay. I'm here to ask for an increase for a position for my office. Uh, we need a domestic violence prosecutor. The one that we had has resigned. And the person that I want to bring in has about 23 years of experience as an attorney, has an experience in handling domestic violence cases, has experience handling family law cases, and of course, typically domestic violence, of course, is connected with family violence. The person who was previously in that position was making a salary, I don't know if I can state it, okay? <laughs> was making a salary of a new attorney because she was, in fact, a new attorney. I. When I started in this position on January 1st, it's my understanding that this person had just passed the bar in May, had been hired as her first job as an attorney in September of 2018, and she was given the uh, position as a domestic violence prosecutor. As you know, domestic violence cases are the second most important cases that we have. First, of course, would be um, vehicular homicide. These are the second most important cases that we have, and we have quite a few of them. Domestic violence cases, of course, can escalate from a simple push, of course, until somebody getting killed and gets up to felony court. So we need someone who is, in fact, and I'd like to pass these out, who's, in fact, Experience. Experience in this particular area because of the harm that can come if an offender is not vowed, is not prosecuted properly. I've given you a list of the cases that are, we currently have, domestic violence cases. We have 260 cases, and perhaps we have about 30 of those that are right now in bench warrant status, which means the person did not show up for court. So you see the number of cases that we have. Some of them date back to, I think, 2013 when the person was arrested. These cases are pending right now in our office. We need someone with a lot of experience who can come in, look at these cases, analyze them, and prosecute them. So that's why I'm here at this time asking for an increase for that position. We're asking for an increase of about $8,000 so that I can bring in a person who's experienced who can come in and take care of these cases in a very efficient manner. Okay. Keep going. Okay. <laughs> I thought you'd stop. All right, well, go ahead. I'm fine. Any questions? That's what I was going to ask. Oh, if you have any questions or comments, I would like to show them a lot of um, Real quick, and I appreciate this this, this background. Um, I, I believe I was aware that um, domestic violence is, is, is why it's the second most important, as you say, is trending here in Douglas County. Um, behavior within the families. Um, um, behavior amongst you know close relationships and stuff. So that's something that I've just been mindful of. Now I picked that up somewhere. I was at, I think I was at September Saturday. Something I was talking to someone. They were sharing that statistic. It's like interesting. Uh, it's trending here in Douglas. Uh, that being said, it does require a certain amount of maturity 
um, to handle something that's seasoned. So I, I, I get why you framed this the way you did to get the right person in here. Sometimes you don't need people to cut their teeth on certain things. Um, you, you need to have um, efficiency. So um, um, that, that being said, um, this what you have to ask is eight thousand um, dollars, including benefits, all all in. Is the eight thousand yes. just the salary, or is it all in? It will be all included because the person who's leaving, of course, had benefits. So the person who will be taking her place, of course, would get those benefits as well. So this eight thousand dollars would be an increase in just the salary. Or just salary, all right. Yes. So you, well, you said it. You started one way. I got it. All right. Okay. Um, that's all I need. I'm sure. Good. All right. Okay. Thank you so much. Any other questions from the board? Uh, just one quick. Uh, yes. Uh, is it eight thousand dollars per year, or to finish out this year? Eight thousand dollars per year. So I guess to finish out this year, because we like so this person to start about, about like four thousand. Right. This year. Okay. Yes. Just wanted to clarify that. And, and I also would like to point out that <coughs> this, a lot of this money is paid through the Bauer grant. Because with the Bauer grant, we have to have a domestic a person that is designated as a domestic violence prosecutor. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, and the person that I'm considering is a local attorney, an experienced attorney, someone who's going to stay around. You know, oftentimes in the solicitor's office, we get a lot of uh, new attorneys, and they're in and out. But this person is a local attorney, experienced attorney, been here for a long time, planning on staying here, and is very interested in the position. And they will also be handling also uh, mm -hmm. animal cruelty type cases as well. Okay. Did you hear that, Commissioner? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Mitchell. Yes. Yes. Just, just one. And, and thanks for sharing and, and kind of bringing us up to speed as to your needs to kind of keep your office and make it efficient. Is this dollar uh, will be absorbed in your budget, or, or this is additional funding that needs to make an adjustment to your budget? First question. Additional funding to make an adjustment to my budget. Yeah. <laughs> So, so we'll need to make that adjustment. And I'm assuming, Mark, you've got that clear and know kind of where things look and how if the adjustments come. Again, the next question would be where is it coming from? You know, so. Well, I, I, let me make it clear. I need a, an, an increase. I got you. Okay. Uh, we've had time to say you're right. good. Okay. Uh, we've had conversation. I just want these right. guys, I want everybody else to know. Uh, okay. <laughs> we've had the conversation, so we're good. All right. It would have to come out of one nine and continue. Okay, that's okay. We're going to have the fun mouth. I mean, I'm just trying to make it so, yes, so, so the public will, will know kind of what that is. And we'll, we'll confirm the exact amount. Yeah. And, and, and with that being said, so your, your budget next year on budget cycle and season or whatever that is will increase by roughly $8,000 to continue moving forward. Yes, sir. Correct. Okay. That's all. I just wanted for clarity. So everybody sitting in the room want to just think that it's going to go away or, or it's already massaged within your budget and you had additional funds in your budget that maybe you're not using that you could absorb this amount and move forward. This is going to be an addition to what you need. Correct. Okay. Good enough. I yield back. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Commissioner Mitchell. I believe, Michelle, you, do you have a little information background on where we're going with this? budget transaction. Can you give us a little background? Um, just looking at her, her current salary budget, there aren't funds available in that line to cover this. The no additional aren't. expenditures. No. Okay. Now That's within her operating, that would be up to her because I don't know what the plans are for her office, but within current salaries, no ma'am, the funds okay. are not there. So it would only be a $4,000 impact this year, basically because we're mid-year. So right. but going forward, we just need to take it in the budget going forward. That's but however, case. I'm looking at this backlog that we have work to do, and it sounds like how many, two, 200 cases that's the backlog from 2013? Some of them. 260 cases yeah, 260. is what we pulled as yeah. of today. Okay. So I'm glad you brought your, your data with you. That's important to me. All right, uh, Commissioner Mitchell. I, I just want to kind of close and say, um, and I, I, I yield back to them, but I just want to make sure, and the reason, I mean, we've had a conversation, but I just want to make sure the, the general public and, and the commission know kind of where we're going with this. Now, I know we talk about this only talking about the end of the year. We might as well just go ahead and say, if we're doing it, do it, versus trying to make the adjustment. The adjustment is the, the additional $4,000 just because we make year. Yeah, that is correct. And, but go ahead. And additionally, I'd like you all to know that uh, we will be audited by VAWA. Um, next week, mm -hmm. and I'm sure they would like to know whether or not we're going to have a exactly. domestic violence prosecutor and the experience uh, that is And that is covered. And that is covered. Okay, all right. So I'll yield back. So I will be, you know, I get me trying to, you know, get Michelle and everybody else to kind of say there's only four, we only need this, but you need to kind of account for it and be done. 
Like, but once those sour is once the sour is there, it'll it's automatic. It'll kick in. It'll okay. kick in. Right. 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 I got right. you. Yeah. Okay. So we'll see it during the budget. I got you. Okay. Thank you very much. I yield. You yield back. Okay. okay. All right. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you all. Oh, wait, we have one question from I just, I just want to, just for clarity for me, the additional $8,000, is this because she has the experience or is this the going right for that? <coughs> Both. Okay. Both. Both. Okay. So that will ensure that you won't be back up here next year because she's left us and somebody else is coming in. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Are you okay? Oh, okay. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, thank so you. We appreciate your presentation. And thank you for bringing me back with your case load report. All right. Uh, commissioners, we have tab number five and six related to the Fox Hall project. We had repetitive discussions about um, Fox Hall. That's why the delivery didn't put a name by here. And uh, we will vote up and down tomorrow. So if there are no discussions from the Board of Commissioners, I'm going to move on. Any discussion uh, regarding topic five and six? And I can just read those authorization to approve the guarantee of regional infrastructure bonds for the Fox Hall project. Tab number six, authorization to approve an amendment to the 2016 intergovernmental agreement for the Fox Hall project and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Any discussion? Uh, Vice Chairman Ro Robinson and then I'll get to you. Uh, Commissioner Carthen, before I move on. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll keep this really tight. Again, long day to day. Um, but I want to put some context to this because this. this while we need to move on, we also need to be accountable for our actions um, thus far. Um, there's been some questions as to why we need to even consider this. Well, like with anybody who applies for a job or anything else, if you go through the process, you're entitled to that. You should be protected in your, your uh, ability to ask. And for us to consider, no different than the Supreme Court, is that, well, we, we can give up, give consideration however that plays out. So I want to be sensitive that nobody gets excluded from consideration regardless of your social economic status, regardless of demographics. This board is open for business. And if anybody wants to bring something before us, I think they should be allowed to, if they make it through the gates. I mean, obviously it's not guaranteed you'll make it to the board of commissioners. You've got to go through the various processes. But I think that's important sometimes. I see the narrative that gets out there. And um, I, I believe that, you know, First Amendment goes both ways. That being said, um, on this, on um, I, I do want to say for District 2, this is important. This is not when we come from our corners and we weigh in. For District 2, I do believe in economic development. I've been consistent, right? Uh, I believe in abatements. Um, I believe in all the tools that are given to the development authority without backing off. I, I believe in them. But there's a balance to everything. And so I'm going to start with the first topic, which was regional infrastructure, um, or to, to guarantee um, these bonds. Um, while I believe in economic development, and I do believe that we need to uh, focus um, in the West, uh, as we just heard from the retail perspective, that was a, a brilliant segue, though it wasn't in, in, intentional. Um, we need to focus to the West. We do need to open up the West and do what's necessary uh, to be able to advance that. District 2 is pretty much built out. And just like they're saying, we've got some pockets, we've got some empty buildings, and we're always talking about <coughs> you know, property taxes and a residential burden. Well, you've got to be able to invest in something to be able to get that return, right? You, you can't just believe that it's going to just happen. You can't close your eyes and think it's got to be deliberate, a deliberate investment. So from that perspective, um, I, I believe that we should focus on the West, uh, specifically the Cap Siri area, um, as far as infrastructure is concerned. However, I do not believe in guaranteeing bonds. There's no way. Absolutely not. Not for infrastructure. And I'm, I'm going to be very quick because tomorrow is just an up and down vote. But I need to be specific because, again, a lot of money was spent to sort of assess this, so I don't want to be short on my, my conclusions. From, but, and this is for my district, my one vote. Um, if you think about it, um, there was a lot of um, attention that went into sort of should we or should we not. And one of the things, in, in, um, Jennifer Hallman, um, I need your help on this, um, would, um, over the past, my, my time here, we've been very deliberate about how we use the Treasury, as one of the judges says, as far as oversight. We've done a very good job of overseeing, right? In other words, the money that's been taxed, we've been good as a Board of Commissioners um, to appropriate it accordingly um, and to be d disciplined. Jennifer Hall, the Director, can you give us both the last standard and um, poor's reporting on our efforts? Um, they had uh, made mention, of course, we have a double A, which is a very good rating, credit rating. 
Um, they had mentioned that we have strong management, fiscally responsible, and that we are very conservative or have good conservative budgeting practices. And then Moody's um, also said we have strong management as well as um, our modest debt. We have modest debt burden tied to self-supporting revenues, which was a positive for the county. And I want to give that as context, that, that while I believe in investment, while I believe in partnerships, there's a limit. And I learned something from my mom, you, you don't, don't <coughs> co-sign for anyone um, unless it's yours. Uh, we, we work too hard. I mean, no, we're, not, we're not the biggest, we're not the strongest per se in the county, I mean in the region, but we hold our own. And I just, I, I did not believe in guaranteeing those bonds. I think it would, we would take a, a credit rating hit, and that I can't have. We work too hard to get to this point where we, they're like, why are y'all doing this? And the second thing is that we can do better from a financing perspective. But we want to finance this. I mean, I don't need somebody, some third party to facilitate how we need to do something. Don't need it. Don't need their advice. We got this. So from that perspective, um, to the Board of Commissioners for, for this, my suggestion would be to decline this. I'm very honest with you. That's where I'm at. Decline the authorization of guarantee, no guarantee. Um, perhaps taking the committee and let um, Mark Teal, his leadership with his staff, um, um, Miguel, um, Chris Pumphrey, all those guys, um, Gil, to figure out um, some, some type of play um, in which we're just focusing on um, 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 Cap Fury, laying a foundation. Um, um, as far as, um, again, we're talking about infrastructure. Um, as far as uh, going on private property, I, I don't support that. I'm just one vote, but I don't support. I think um, the 2016 gave sufficiency, um, and to go into private property for public roads is just that, that that's enough. Back in 16, I said that was very rich. It's like, I get it. It's rich. And I, I think it's like, come on now. You gotta pay for your infrastructure? I'm just, it's time to be honest about this. And uh, while we give everybody consideration, now you, you laid out your cars, and I just think that we spent enough time on this. I think, again, it, it's full board of commissioners will um, to focus out there as far as regional infrastructure. I'm in on that. Um, as far as guaranteeing anything regarding infrastructure in this, I can't support so I'm let that go. All right, going to my second point, sis. Now, I'm sure you put them both together. Um, as it relates to intergovernmental agreement, Again, we spent a lot of time on this. Uh, but one of the things in the last 2016 we put in place, uh, again, um, it was three times. Plan A was to guarantee all the all, um, entire bond for 150 million. And then we, we, we said no. Think about it. $150 million was asked the first time in Plan A. That means we would not have a spot today. Think about it. It was like absolutely not. All right? Plan D, B was obviously the 2016. I voted against that, uh, but I did, uh, once the Board of Commissioners approved it, I did support the intergovernmental agreement. And then that's when I cleaned up and put the policy in place for the development authority. We shall not do another 30 years. We shall not put any more money into um, what we said. And I'll just leave it at that. Those were the concessions. Again, I was in the minority party. I could not control sort of the bigger picture and how it was going to roll, but that's okay. I had enough to influence it. That's important. So asking for a 99-year lease. That puts me against the very thing I put in place from a policy. Like, no. It is what it is. I think that's too much. If switching Google and all of them can fit in a 10 year box, then I, I just, but I get it. I, I, I get to ask, but it's like, okay, y'all need to go get some more equity partners. Like, it, it's, too, it's, it's too leveraged. It, it, it's too much on the burden. Like, God, you had 16. And it's okay to ask. I get it. But the fairness of this, um, Using the word, uh, it, it just needs to be a little bit more balanced. Um, I don't think the board of commissioners are in this place. Uh, from, um, again, district two. Um, I, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a little bit much, um, to be very honest, um, for the ask. My last conclusion about the intergovernmental agreement was, and this is something that I had I had to sort of get this conclusion because it, it, it was this emphasis on the conference center, the conference center, the conference center, the conference center, right? And you had the hotel over here hidden. It was like, well, and then it finally got, we went, uh, we took a, uh, we went to the Avalon, and it was the same design as the Avalon of an Alpharetta. It was like, oh, they're the same building. Oh, my God. I'm like, wait a minute, if they're the same, in other words, the design is an integrated building, they're not two separate buildings, they're, they're together. So it's like, okay, I just felt that once I got into this, there were some things about this that was sort of, okay, well, wait a minute, 
Well, that 99 year lease is about to be leveraged against the whole building. Oh, my God. It's like, and, and so there were some things about this that made me pause. Um, that, that, like, okay, uh, give me more insight into the occupancy as place to the hotel. We just, it was like pulling teeth for this. And to be very honest, I, I said this when our last open session um, that I, I believe this should have been tighter. Um, I've been on both sides. So this wasn't an indictment of our development authority or anything like this. It's just like, come on, guys. I could be better than this. Why didn't you give me the full picture? Why did I have to go through such lengths? Uh, the, the, the citizens don't pay me enough to do this, but then I did it for the sake of yeah, it was the right thing. So for my my vote, um, I'm, I'm 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 less inclined to, to vote for um, the next item as well, which is to change the city government. I think 16, which was approved, is sufficient. It's approved. I mean, I perhaps you know, I'll, I'll leave, leave my comments for someone else, but. I believe that 16 was sufficient, um, as is. Um, but to, to do more is like we need to go look somewhere else. I think the board commissioners, that decision was sufficient by itself, right? It's not that we, it, and again, when you think about a partnership, and we heard that from our, uh, and I want to thank Ken um, and his team and uh, Jennifer and your team consultants to help us get through this process, because we had to look at it. But we should have learned a lot about this. And we come to appreciate sort of the value of the exchange. Like, what are we getting out of this? Um, and this simply felt like a transaction. It did not simply feel like a partnership. And while I want to see at the end of the day, it says, okay, but it, it, you have to look at it for what it really is. <coughs> and, and while again, I'm committed to the West uh, and being strategic on how we approach that, um, for the district too, I just don't think this is in our best interest. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Vice Chairman Robinson. Uh, Commissioner Carpenter. Um, I was a little confused about why five and six was split up, but then I just heard his comment, so it kind of made, made it clear. So our 2016 intergovernmental intergovernmental agreement is into its third year. One, has that been rejected fully by this Board of Commissioners, and that's why you're having to re-sign it, or are we just voting on it for the 99-year lease period? That's that's my first thing, so I guess that would be, I don't know if that would be Ken or <coughs> Yeah, I can answer that. I, I think they're just asking for changes, and the two are overlapping, five and six. Are overlapping. The 16 is still in play. So 16 I mean, it's on. It's already written, signed, and sealed. Okay. So with it being signed, sealed, and almost delivered, if it hasn't been completed by a certain time, can we do a sunset clause? Because it seems like we're, 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 we're coming back and forth with this, and, and at some point, it either needs to be executed or we need to take it off the table because 30 years is very rich, in my opinion. I wasn't here during that time, but 30 years is a good bit of abatement for any corporation. And again, we didn't give that to Google, we didn't give that to Amazon, but we gave it to Foxhall. And by and large, I agree, it's a beautiful property. I went to visit it. Harrison Merrill, his he and his son are absolute visionaries. I love what the concept is. But again, for the government to get that involved in a private project, I think is just not viable for us. And for the constituents that keep emailing me and calling me, I kind of want this to be, you know, put to bed. So can we do a sunset call? Well, uh, your agreement right now, the 16 agreement between the BOC and the Development Authority, you can go to the Development Authority and there's some legal theories about sunsetting this at some point because of it, if it fails. But I won't get into all those legal remedies at this stage. But your agreement right now is only with the development authority. Okay. All right. I yield back. You yield back. Okay, Commissioner Guider. Yes. <coughs> uh, I was here in 2016. I voted against it in 2016, mainly because of 30 year, 100 percent abatement. And uh, we, like you, uh, Commissioner Cotham. Uh, stated we have not offered that to anybody else um, and we should never offer that again and I think I saw a letter saying that from the development authority they would not ever bring us a 30-year abatement again I hope I remember that correctly but the, it was not uh, just a plan A and B it was A, B and C because in between A for the uh, backing of all the bonds was the EB-5 
uh, backing uh, money that they wanted to get from the foreign investors, which fell through too. So, and then it was, uh, this is coming back to us again. Um, I would say we should never have another intergovernmental agreement with the development authority, anybody else that did not, does not have a sunset date included. And I don't see how we ever, uh, that was ever agreed upon. Like I said, I voted against it then, mainly because of the 30 year bank. Uh, we should stick to our uh, 10 year abatement that's tiered, that they, the, whoever the developer is, they pay a little bit at a time until they, uh, the 10 years is up. But we should never give anybody 100% abatement on anything. And as you said, um, it's a beautiful property, absolutely gorgeous property down there. And, uh, but I do think if it was such a great investment, they would be turning people away. Uh, that wanted to invest in it. So with that, I go back. Thank you so much, uh, Commissioner Dino. I believe Commissioner Mitchell has some. Just, just one. Yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm not going to get to the whole conversation of the piece, but mm -hmm. I, I respect my colleagues' uh, conversation. But just one. <coughs> We're speaking on five and or six, but I'm assuming we just started off with five. But it's have kind of became one of the same. Yes. However, however. Um, I don't know if this is considered a business item cons uh, consent agenda or um, I don't know if it's just a business. Yeah, so, business it, so it won't be a consent, it won't be, okay, mm -hmm. so it's separate. I just want to make sure just that portion, and, and I guess I'll hold my comment from, uh, for tomorrow. Okay, sounds good. Mm -hmm. All right, um, we're gonna, mm -hmm. we'll keep it in the fair way, and yep. we're going to move on to uh, next item again in the interest of time. So, Board Commissioners, thank you for your feedback, and we look forward to up and down vote tomorrow. Uh, tab number seven: Authorization to create two regional <coughs> op op program positions, Family Treatment Court Case Manager and Family Treatment Court Child Services Case Manager, to be funded by the Q J J D uh, P Grant Fund. Uh, grant funds and uh, <coughs> Mrs. King. Hey Jennifer, how are you? Good. Good morning. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, not Q, it was O, J, J, D. I didn't catch that. My eyes are pretty tricky on me. Thank you. Um, this, th these are the two positions that came out of the federal grant that we received back in, I think it was October. There was a delay in funding, so we've been kind of delayed in, in getting all that together. So these are the, the two uh, positions that are 100% funded by the federal grant. <coughs> okay. Any questions for the board? Mm -hmm. Sounds like pretty good self-explanatory. Tab number eight, authorization to approve a contract for Lar Laurie Johnson mm -hmm. for the Family Treatment Court Case Manager and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Ms. King, again. And that is one of these positions. Um, this is the person that we have interviewed and hired, decided to hire for the case manager position. Okay. Any questions for the board? Okay, we'll keep moving. Tab number nine, authorization to approve a contract for Don Paul for the Family Treatment Court Child Services Case Manager and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents subject to final legal review. Jennifer King again. Um, same thing, the other position, the Child Services Case Manager, this is the person that we want to hire for that position. Okay, self-explanatory. Thank you so much. Tab number 10, authorization to amend the budget and accept the supplemental grant award in the amount of $2,615 for furniture and technology to our family treatment court program with no match and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Jennifer again. Yes, ma'am. This um, was kind of an extra grant that we were awarded. We thought it was going to be in the, around six thousand dollars. Once all the applications, everybody got in. And, um, the award is twenty six fifteen, um, only for technology and furniture. Okay. Any questions from the board? Okay, we're going to move on to the next item. Tab number 11, authorization to amend the budget and accept the grant award in the amount of $1,000 for training for two employees in our family treatment court program and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Jennifer King again. This is also through the federal grant. Um, there's an assessment that we have to complete on all participants for our program, and they're changing what we've been using to a new one. So they're 
granting $1,000 to the court to send two people to training for this new assessment tool um, instead of paying the trainer, I guess they're, this is a better way for them to operate. So we'll get it in, in the form of a grant that will then turn around and pay for our training. Okay, thank you. Uh, any questions from the board? Thank you, uh, Jennifer. Thank you so thank much. You. We'll move on to tab number 12. Uh, 12, acceptance of a memorandum of understanding to allow free transfers between Connect Douglas Transit Service and Cobb Link Transit Services pending final legal review. Director Watson, good morning. Thank you. Thank you, good afternoon. Morning. Uh, as we get ready to launch our fixed route service, one thing that is very important to us is to have free transfers between Connect Douglas and Cobb Link. This is a topic that's been under discussion for a number of months. Uh, Connect Douglas staff and Cobb Link staff <coughs> agree that this is something that is needed. But as with pretty much everything, uh, we need something in writing. So uh, we <coughs> drafted a memorandum of, of understanding. Uh, our staff worked on it a lot and the county's legal staff worked on it a great deal too and we appreciate their help with it. Uh, we drafted it, we submitted it to Cobb County and finally uh, this weekend actually they responded back to us with some changes um, on the MOU. Uh, I don't think any of the changes are very significant. Uh, Mr. Bernard has had an opportunity to, to look over it uh, for a, an initial review and and I'll let him address uh, the changes in, in his thoughts. Um, yeah, I, I think uh, essentially it's nominal changes and nothing of substance in my opinion. There was a couple typos they sent over, we'll fix those. Uh, I think the biggest thing, if I can remember Gary, was as far as building anything like a bench or a sign or a graphic on their stop, they want their, you. They want y'all to, to cooperate with them, submit it, and then have a separate agreement as to if it's approved or not, which is fine with me. <coughs> Essentially what they're saying is it's still free to the transit recipients out here. I'm sorry, I got bad allergies today. The transfer is still free. No substantive changes were made. The issue came up regarding whether or not there's signage and whatnot. I think what they've said in, on their property any signage or build or bench or cover would have to go through them and separately be approved pursuant to this, which makes sense, it's there. Mm -hmm. They don't want to just blanket it. But as far as what we were directed to look at, <coughs> we're comfortable that their changes are essentially not, not, not uh, significant in any measure. Mm -hmm. So what we would have asked, asked of the board tomorrow is to approve this uh, memorandum of understanding with, with Cobb County and if they come back again with us with any additional changes of course we have submit it to legal for review great any questions from board commissions or comments advice from Robson. yeah i mean again we're at the final, almost at the, at, at the end or the, the commencement as opposed to the end of the age but the, the beginning of an era um, as it relates to providing additional mobility options to the public one of the things that i recall madam chair um, you know I think it was last year, we were on a conference call with Representative Tanner mm -hmm. from the General Assembly. And one thing that he acknowledged when they were telling us that the ATL was about to come out, it was sort of a briefing for the for chairman. I just happened to be in the room on, on, as a courtesy. But um, it, it, Representative Tanner said that your model down in Douglas County is what we're looking at, um, we, we, we looked at and acknowledged as reasonableism. Because that was important. Right, so I know that um, obviously it was a process that we had to go through to get this to this place. Some concessions had to be made. Uh, specifically, uh, I appreciate uh, Commissioner Moore here helping me get that out of committee and eventually came to the full board of commissioners with compromise going to HE Homes. We heard. Now, from a leadership perspective, like, okay, how do I get from here to there? And sometimes you have to, you know, uh, you have to concede. And, and listen to the public, not only just um, Commissioner Molecare, but what he was representing by way of a voice. He said, that's a lot of long distance. That's like, okay. 
So we connected and made sense for Cobb because they said, look, oh, gee, we got these big mega buses. You're going to help fill us up. And so it was a good partnership. And I, I, this was one part, and, and Gary, Direct Boston, you know, I, I want to follow. We had to fit, fulfill this and finish this. So I'm glad we're at this place to finishing it, which means that people, and this is where I'm going, people in Douglas County, again, to get over there, what route will they connect with? Gary, this is process real quick. Cobbling 30. Cobbling 30. So our, which route is ours? 40. All right, so the 40 will connect right there at the epicenter, right there Six Flags and Riverside, right yes. there at that little side access road. Mm -hmm. um, they'll connect there. Um, we'll put in money or what? Because we talked about this in the Transportation Committee, but I need this to be a full record. How will they transfer? They'll, they'll have a transfer card. Yeah. If someone's riding um, our, our vehicle and they want to make that tra transfer over to Cobb, as they're departing our bus, the driver will give them a transfer card. And that's what they'll use to get on the, the cop link vehicle and uh, the reverse will be the same too if, if someone's riding the cop link vehicle and it's transfer to ours they will get a transfer card from cop link so, thank you so much any other uh, comments before the board okay thank you so much we excited <coughs> Next, we have tab number 13, authorization to renew mutual aid agreements with Brady Emergency Medical Services, Puckett Emergency Medical Services, Metro Atlanta um, Ambulance, and West Georgia Ambulance Service, and allow the fire chief to sign all related documents pending final legal review. Fire Chief Scott Spencer. Yes, ma'am. Uh, annually, we have uh, contracts with these private ambulance services. Uh, to help us out when we run out of ambulances mm -hmm. and when they run, of it, run out of ambulances we help them out if we have units available. Uh, it's only if units are available uh, so no, no cost to the county uh, and we don't have to pay them any fund either so that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. By any questions? from forward? Okay. Thank you. I'm sorry. Commissioner Mitchell. <laughs> yes Chief. Just one quick So, So with that um, whomever picks up, how, how, how we build their build, how, how is that kind of, <coughs> you know, if, if we use somebody, if they use come to Douglas County and do something? Uh, Puckett, okay. uh, bail of our range, uh, if they pick up. Uh, well, that's what I'm speaking of, West Georgia. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, but I do know, <coughs> I, I, I can get that information back to you. <coughs> I'm just curious, I mean, you know, I'm, it's not a cost to us, but whomever no. that, the, whomever's it, receiving that, Right, it, it is a cost to the patient. Right. Uh, so I'll get I'll get those numbers for you. Yeah. I mean, at least they'll know if it's astronomically high versus our numbers are you know as low as we could make them. You know, I don't know. Just I'm just curious. Yes, sir. If you would, thank you. I do that. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Mitchell. All right, I'll move on to the next tab. Uh, Chief, you have the next one, which is uh, tab number 14, authorization to renew agreement with West Georgia. Technical, co uh, technical college for the EMS clinical rotations and authorize the chairman to sign all the related documents and uh, pending final legal review. Yes, ma'am. Uh, this is our local college here. Uh, they have an EMT program. Uh, they allow uh, their students to ride with us. Uh, that gives us the advantage of looking at those students while they're still in training to see if we think they'd be a good fit for our department. Uh, and over the years we've hired quite a number of those students uh, for our department uh, because once they see our department and uh, how we operate, uh, most of them tend to like us. Sure. Any questions from the board or comments? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, be real quick. Um, so we, we, uh, West Georgia Technology is a source um, of, of, of talent. About military, would you do you accept military or that like no, we have to go you our way? In other words, don't bring that over here. How, I mean, what's your philosophy, Chief? On uh, yes, sir, we do accept military. However, the state of Georgia requires that they get a state certification, which is a, a, a national registry exam yeah. that they have to take and pass. Uh, so, uh, there are combat medics that have seen far worse than. We probably have seen right. uh, uh, and have treated it well. Uh, and as long as they can pass that test, we're, we're game on. Bring them okay. home. So you, you don't shun away from that? I, I just was at this. No, no just sir. <coughs> no, sir. We, we, we don't shun away from that at all. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. 
We're going to move on to the next tab, which is, you have this one as well, uh, Chief. Authorization to amend the agreement with the Image Trend software to allow for the agency level uh, validation on patient care re uh, reports and fire incident reports at all initial costs, at an initial cost of $11,350 as recommended by the Fire Chief EMS, I'm sorry, the Fire and the EMS Committee. Fire Chief, can you tell us a little bit about this one? Yes, ma'am. Currently, uh, when, when we uh, pick up a patient, take them to the hospital, uh, we have to fill out what's called a patient care report. <coughs> we fill that out. Uh, and there are certain fields that the state of Georgia requires to be filled out for that document to be validated. Uh, once those are filled out, uh, our medic can close out of that program and they're good to go as far as the state is concerned. What this agency level validation will allow us to do is add certain fields that will not allow our medic to close out of that document until they get those fields filled in, such as a patient signature, insurance information, uh, all of which uh, should increase our revenues for the uh, EMS. Your ability to collect your revenues. <coughs> mm -hmm. <coughs> okay. Any questions or comments from the board? <coughs> All right, I believe we're fine. Thank you. Thank you. And last but not least, we have tab number 16, authorization to approve a change order with Barnsley Consultant for the courthouse security renovation project in the amount of $147,432 and amend the budget and authorize the chairman to sign all the related documents. Mark Price, our... Uh, if the board will allow, I'm going to defer to Eric Johnson with CPS. He can... Uh, Explain. Give an overview of what's going on here. Okay, thank you. Well, I was going to say good morning, but good afternoon, Madam good afternoon. Chairman and uh, fellow commissioners, uh, city man or county manager. Um, real quick, I'm going to give a brief update on the court security project that we're handling. Uh, things seem to be going really well. I know it's uh, heard the hammer drill going in the middle of some of the speeches, but in any regards, uh, where the project kind of stands right now, we're in the throes of finishing up site work out back. Uh, doing a lot of the finishes um, that you see it down there right now. We should be done for the most part by the end of June with all the heavy stuff. Should be pretty much cleaned up. The one thing that were um, probably be out of your hair by the middle of July, we made a couple changes on the package screeners uh, that uh, not too much in the weeds, but try to get it remotely work with the sheriff's office. And by the way, between the county staff, uh, the judges, the sheriff's office, it's collectively gone really, really well. Um, so with that, there was some ways on how you're operating and, and some of the nuances of how we're securing it. So operationally, how it's working well with the sheriff's office. And I think some of the things that were, some things that they wanted um, that uh, from a funding standpoint, they're gonna work out between the, the sheriff's office and the, the county. But in any regards, we're here for uh, approval of a change order in the amount of 147000 Four hundred thirty-two dollars. If you recall, the original contract price was a million three hundred and thirty thousand two hundred fourteen dollars. Mm -hmm. So this will bring the grand total to a million four hundred seventy-seven thousand six hundred and forty-six dollars. Okay. Any questions from the board, Commissioner Butcher, Vice Chairman Robinson, <coughs> and then I'm yeah. happy, Commissioner. I don't know. Um, yeah, I'm always. This, this is a project that was a carryover from the um, prior administration. I've always been following uh, like with the jail, following the budget, um, and, and making sure we, um, we we keep up with the costs associated with, with, with safety. Um, specifically, um, this hundred um, county administrator, what so where's the source coming from to fund this? So $78,958 is included in the courthouse security budget. Okay. Um, so we would need 68400 approximately. $68,474 from uh, one dining contingency. All right, do we know? All right, my next point is recently, and I just, just this is just timeliness, uh, we talked about security. Um, uh, some of you may have picked up on the news recently, and I, I'm very seldom follow it, but I just happened to see this one um, out in the cab or whatever it was. Um, their Maloof building, their version of you know an admin building was, was hit. And I'm just curious um, for our windows and stuff like that, how secure do we have alarms and stuff? I mean, I, I think it's still public, it's, it's necessary. Do we, do we, what, how, what will protect that? I mean, 
I'm just curious. We, we um, have, well, we have, we the, the easy answer is, uh, it's a great question. So let me drop back. When we did the jail annex, going and it faces 278, we had some of the same issues because there was some <coughs> sensitive stuff going on um, in there. We had all, you know, um, the sheriff's investigative divisions and everybody, witnesses and everything else. So we actually put ballistic glass in the front of the facade on 278 for that very reason. I don't believe you have ballistic glass on the first floor. Of, of this courthouse um, so you can do that it's very pricey um, but you certainly can do that the technology is out there we've, we've done it a lot in a lot of places um, one namely like Forsyth County for coming they have some issues at their courthouse same sort of situation um, you can also as far as a security you can put um, glass break technology in the rooms it's a couple things you can do commissioner but uh, probably <coughs> the most wholesale easy um, is to secure it would be some sort of ballistic impact glazing that we do use in jails. They come in different ratings, 45 minute ratings. Uh, very pricey, but that would do it for you. Uh, but that that's not what we contemplated in in this project. But that's great. That's a great question. That's, yeah. in, our, in my opinion, that's probably your most vulnerable spot after this renovation. Yeah, and, and again, it's just one of those. It's, it's, it's more curiosity. I'm not trying to suggest that I had a. An opinion on our design and how we approached it just again because of the, yes, sir. the recency of, of what was on TV uh, but that being said I mean you know if you hit a window does the like our houses do an alarm go off or and I'm, I'm looking more at them like okay you had these people roll up in there and it's like okay how long did it take you to respond I know they had cameras but I mean um, there's not an alarm that goes off I mean it's more stuff like that how'd y'all approach it I mean it seems like our screening has more to do with people coming into the courthouse uh, doing hours. My question is more after hours because it's related. We under this guys have not have not looked at that, but it would not be any heavy lift, uh, Commissioner, for us to look at that uh, while we're completing this uh, this work and over the next month. So we could come back work with Mark Price and Mark Teal and provide some sort of report on the uh, other uh, issues that uh, may or may not uh, be out there with respect to this current design. Okay. I'll let it go. I'm good now, sir. Okay. Thank you so much, Vice Chairman. You know, I'll, I'll commission that. I'll leave you raise your hand. Yes. And then uh, these uh, change orders, uh, were they just left out of the bid? Because uh, I see replacing the terrazzo floors or refinishing the terrazzo floors. Wouldn't that have been in the bid to begin with? Yes, ma'am. And that's a great question because we weren't really sure what was the best way to handle it. When we pulled back all those uh, walls that were in there, you had an existing terrazzo flooring system, and we didn't know how easily it would be to match the two systems. But when we came back, the long-term most um, effective way from a maintenance and operation standpoint was to come in and put terrazzo. I think at that point in design, we, we were going to carpet those areas uh, just because we weren't really sure. To, they were on the outer lying areas. Uh, but when we got in there, Traza seemed to be the better fix for, and have a nicer entrance in the front. So. I noticed the ceiling was right. I'm sorry. Let me add, your old Traza was broken. Yeah. Uh, the so, entrance, yes. So, mm -hmm. There were places where it could completely come, come loose from the floor yeah. because it's a 21 year old building. And it's a high high traffic high the flooring and of course part of this i think is to try to refinish when you if you, you look at it i'm sure and you see that the new looks new and the old looks worn out so but they're going to i think we're going to try correct. to refinish that a little bit polish it i think we talked about doing that as well but that that I mean, is correct that's part of what is, is contemplated in this okay. There's also, I mean, I've been at the meetings, and a lot of these are just things that happen that weren't contemplated. That a lot of small things, you know, for example, moving the columns on the the closed side and redoing the floor over there, you know, that we've never opened. That'll be open now. Well, you, you can't just rip them out. You've got to refinish when you do that, and that's part of it. I believe that's part of what's in here. Is more, yes. Things like that, that, that the engineer didn't necessarily leave out. It's just what necessarily contemplated. Okay, and the ceiling was raised to, uh, it was raised, is there a reason for that? I think that we worked very close. Um, 
the sheriff's office was very concerned working with judges for visual uh, live lines of sight so that was most of the reason why we, we raised stuff up moved stuff out of the way mm -hmm. just for security reasons and having that sheriff's office right behind there same thing with the package screeners they wanted to have a remote uh, ability to review those packages so everybody wasn't kind of congested trying to move people through so but these are not none of these are design flaws no ma'am no, okay. no ma'am a lot of the what we're doing at, at, with that new station is in response to the, the frontal assault that occurred in Forsyth County. This man right. came to the, with the, so the, the rifle, the AR-15 rifle with a drum of ammunition and grenades and drove right up on the courthouse steps <coughs> and tried to enter and take the courthouse hostage. That's a lot of what is, is, is going into that safety, that box that you see down there. And by the way, the sheriff has actually funded the uh, ballistic panels that we put there on there. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not in this, but uh, we all evaluated that and made it so that it could resist an AR-15 assault rifle. Right. And do you anticipate these being the last change orders? That's another great question. I, I, <laughs> I was told don't say yes, that it incorporates all of it. I must not want to. I'd say from the meetings I've been yeah. in, I think we're pretty darn close. I, I, I would, I, there may be a couple small things that come up, but I think all in all, I mean, we talked about it this morning, we feel really good about it. If something, we might find some other last minute unforeseen something that happened. Okay, so it should not be anything of any significance if we see anything, but I, I'm a very positive guy. I, I would hope we, as the judges said, I hope we have you know, kind of flushed it all out. That I yield back. Okay, thank you so much, Commissioner uh, Commissioner Mitchell. I agree. Don't say that. <laughs> I won't say that. However, I mean, uh, some things that you just can't see don't. That's right. You just, I mean, because I'm thinking a change order needs to be looked at. Uh, referencing uh, Vice Chair Robinson about we've got the secure entrance, but the downstairs, it's going to be some concerns because that probably says attention about the windows the doors and you know somebody come up here with their m16 you know making their rounds and trying to make a move of that caliber we may secure i don't think they're going to come through the most secure place which would be the entrance they're going to take a different route and the easier i think uh route that's going to have some concerns down the road i mean it's going to be those side entrance and i know we're going to lock them down and all that kind of good stuff but with the window set up on that whole makeup, there's going to be some need to kind of do some some research to find out what can we put up there where this triple pane windows and I don't know you know the the right stuff that you'll put there to kind of offset something of that caliber. But that's what I'm saying. I think that's going to be another change if there's a change need to be done, or do we feel secure enough that nobody will come on the side entrance and try to get in? I guess they'll just kind of come through the front entrance and say, okay, I'm going to go through where the the, the resistance are. <laughs> Let me just mention Thank you, Judge. That, that's really beyond the scope of what we are contemplating. Oh, I agree. And, 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 and it just thought, know, yes. but, but yes. things change. Yes. And so, you know, I, I encourage the board to, to study that and come back and look at that. It's, it's not in this project, but I'd be glad to help and, and participate in that next project. One of the important things that we've looked at, though, is, is the cameras mm -hmm. and the security system mm -hmm. and the lines of sight. Mm -hmm. Uh, because that's a lot of our our ability for people to see for our security. We have our security mm -hmm. all of this building, mm -hmm. but the uh, for example, Monica Miles' car was broken in on this uh, <coughs> over down in that parking lot, and they couldn't see it because of the trees. Understood. And so that's one of the things <coughs> the board needs to look at is the lines of sight that our cameras for our security system do have a clear line of sight. So if somebody is doing something they shouldn't do. Our security people can see it, and that would be a good thing. So we can see them breaking in. Yes, and, and then how do we catch? How do we prevent? Right, <laughs> that's the other part. Of two that. things: well, either <laughs> either more cameras or less trees. <laughs> right. that's, and that's, that's, that's okay. I agree. I agree. And that's part 100%. of the trade-off. Yes, uh, you know, the, the fewer cameras save money, uh, but at the same time, and we, you know, we we they look real closely at, at for example, the new gate and mm -hmm. how that's designed and yeah. the mm -hmm. uh, for that parking lot that day. So that's all a trade-off, and it's all a trade-off based on how much and we want to do. Well, I, th I think this board will take a harder look at 
the, the, the future, well, well, especially with the, the, the side entrance. Mm -hmm. But I think it's something that needs to be talked about and thought about because I just see that's the, uh, the weakest link mm -hmm. from what I see in the future of this project. Yes, we're great coming into the entrance, but for those who kind of have some unique moments, it won't be the side, I mean, it won't be the front entrance that they'll take. Well, you know. Let me point to another issue. Okay. Okay. I think Mark's brought this, the loading dock. Yes. You know, that's, yes. Is that fair to say? Well, yes. Yes. And that's, that's one of our yes. concerns. Yeah. And, and I encourage the board to continue to study that and we'll be glad to participate. That's just something to, to think about in the future uh, when y'all got plenty of extra money. I'm not sure they never did. If we base it on dollars and on money, then that'll never happen. <laughs> I think it needs to be based on the mere fact of safety that it needs to be addressed if we're going to make this courthouse secured. Fully. Be glad to work with y'all whenever you're ready to have those conversations. And, and I know you'll be willing to give up some of your budget to kind of make some of this happen. <laughs> However, <laughs> but this depends on how many you want to leave in the jail. <laughs> 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 so, <laughs> so, I'll be joking. But at the end of the day, I, I just think that's something that, I mean, I, I, I spoke to Vice Chair and I had a nice long conversation about that. And, and that is going to be an interesting moment down the road. And, and I don't think we need to wait on it. No. We need to go ahead and address it sooner than later. Yes. So two things, Commissioner Mitchell. It's a great point. So when you talk about to step back, and unfortunately I've been doing it for 35 years, what, what, you're try, what we're talking about doing is you're trying to delay the incident long enough to where security can get there and secure the area. Okay, so all this stuff we're doing mm -hmm. is just delaying what somebody else is trying to do. Okay, mm -hmm. so this glazing, you can buy 10 minute glazing, 45 minute glazing. So all that means is somebody can beat on that or shoot at that window for 45 minutes before somebody I'm goes sure. out there and gets it. Yes. So we, I'll get with uh, the county manager and we'll, by the time we're through with this project, we could probably pull something together and show you where your vulnerable issues exactly. are. Yes. Probably put a cost to it and just try to get things rolling for y'all. I know we've talked with some of the stuff with Judge Emerson and Mark Price. A couple of things with Mark Teal, uh, but um, and I'll add though, and I'll add the cameras uh, is a good band aid, yep. so you can at least see the guys coming in or breaking your cars or getting in, in, in the, the weakest link side of this. But uh, I'll also tell you this: those cameras typically are a deterrent, uh, yes. and they don't eliminate. You're no, able to exactly determine right. who did something, and then everybody out there in the general public knows. Well, don't go rob <laughs> that over at the courthouse because they're going to find you and they've got the cameras and they'll want to and, and that's what I'm saying so don't 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 go shy on the cameras even if there's a change order to, to at least say here's we're clear got to, to kind of do that much at least but that's the band-aid that that's not the fix right there's so, nowhere close to being the fix fortunately I think we have a pretty good handle on this courthouse and I think we can help you out all right so we'll get with the kind of manager. okay sure okay and I, and I yield so. thank you so much uh, Commissioner uh, Mitchell and I believe you have one more thing yeah. uh, Commissioner Patty. yes real quickly uh, uh, when we built the jail, we had a contingency fund for overruns. Mm -hmm. Did we not have one set aside for this? So we had $78,958. That's all we had Is for it, contingency. And that's uh, the secure, That's where we're taking the 78000 from? Yes, and then the balance would be 60, approximately 68474 from contingency. So that wasn't, it wasn't a 10% contingency no, or anything like that? Okay, um, and cameras are good, but they won't stop a gun or a car or whatever, but we might um, consider putting some posts down there to stop uh, vehicles from driving right into the glass area. Well, we have we no posts there. Huh? There are concrete bottles. Okay. Right, okay. okay. and, and on the side. Mm -hmm. And I'm so just as far as vehicle driving through okay. the door. <coughs> and and I really think at some point in time we're going to have to address screen, a new screening area for employees. Uh, you know, just look at the news mm -hmm. that we woke up to, mm -hmm. and that was a, a government uh, facility. So we need to uh, keep that on the table. Yes, and I get that. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, real, real quick, we, we keep talking about cameras, but you know, my experience in, in coming through the jail is that the camera selection process or the quality of the vendor was probably not very becoming in just from my perspective. And so I want to I, I challenge and I want to make sure that I, I get where it fits in the arsenal of deterrence. 
um, or um, and used as evidence later. But let's not miss on that. Uh, I didn't like the experience we went through with the, with the jail regarding those cameras and stuff. And you know, much money we spent on that jail, I, I would expect that the camera would be commensurate with that. Uh, I'm not looking for an excuse for it at this moment. I just want to make a statement that make sure we get the cameras right. Because what I don't want to do is come back with a change or something because it was insufficient. I got to do some type of warranty for something that it didn't meet our expectations. Um, if that's an important part, let's make sure it works. That's all I got to say. You know that? Yes, ma'am. And also, in the words of my uh, Angelo, um, once you show me who you are, I believe you, uh, we looked at the news uh, yesterday and I was really concerned. I'm with the Commissioner Guider uh, uh, on security for our, our employees. I believe that they should be screened as well. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the airline pilots, the flight attendants, they're being screened and they're professionals as well. So I just want us to not put some second thoughts around that again. I'm certain when I looked at the news yesterday, it, it kind of sparked my interest. They do a great job of reacting, but I want to be proactive. Yeah. So let's just think about it. I won't be offended if you look at my purse before I come in, and I'm quite sure I'll just want to be. So let's think about that. Yes, so the one real quick thing on how we design that, and that's a great point too. That is all uh, determined on how the Sheriff's Office wants to run security there. They, they're the ones who are going to be able to provide whatever proximity card readers or whatever to whomever. And it may be just a select few that come through that employee site, but there may be none. Uh, we wrestle with that a good bit on some employees who may have big bags that they carry every day. Are they allowed to? So we've set it up, uh, Madam Chair, that the Sheriff's Office will be, I mean, that is their that is their constitutional duty to secure this courthouse, and they will be the ones who will be administering that. Let me Thank you. Add, Judging. Security is just a trade-off. You know, how, mm -hmm. how much we spend, and, and a lot of our mindset in our meetings has been how do we keep this from costing the commission right. a fortune in the future? Mm -hmm. Because you know, security at that front entrance is dictated by how many people we can put y'all and pay the sheriff to put down there. Yes, right. and, and if it's, you know, because uh, we can turn, we have turnstiles where the employees will take their card and go through. That's the contemplated plan <coughs> right now. Uh, they never have to be turned on. That's right. And so then I'll, and if y'all want to say to the sheriff, you prefer for every, every employee, and I, I'm familiar with what happened um, recently. In, in the municipal building, the municipal building. Yeah, was really right. and, and I'm aware that was a, a, a utterly unsuspicious person. Right. He, he had been fired, and he still, we still don't know what the reason was. But if that's what you all want to do, it's just if your employees are going to be waiting, they'll be a little bit. They may be a little disgruntled, but they don't work for me. They work y'all. Mm -hmm. But that's just something you all can. I think with what we've got in place, can say that that's what you prefer. We're going to have, as I understand, four channels. Four lines in. Four lines to pack screeners. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. So the capacity is four times what we've got now if we have the people there to man the metal detectors. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it's a matter of cost. Okay. And the convenience is one thing, the time, the other is people, if it's a cold, rainy day, there might be some folks standing outside, and we went through that with the Cobb County Superior Courthouse. It's a, it's a trade off. And uh, we, But the good thing is, as the judge was saying, it's been designed. With a lot of flexibility, <coughs> as if you want that thing locked down, secure wise, you got it. Put in place to go to the hospital. Let's go through the detectors. We have that ability. But we'll look at the we'll look at the cameras as well. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Any other discussion, board? Thank you so much. Everybody. You're welcome. Thank, thank, you. thank you for coming in today. You're welcome. Board commissioners, before I call for an executive session, I just want to take the time to acknowledge our uh, interns that are here today, the board of commissioners interns. And if I interns, if you could just go to the podium for us and introduce yourselves and tell us who you are, in, which particular board uh, commissioner that you are um, interning for. So if you could just go to the podium, please. <coughs> And give us your name and just and we want to welcome you and just tell us what school you go to so we're real excited and your major and just tell us what you're majoring in so whoever want to go first that's fine <laughs> <laughs> hi hi my name is Uchenna Iacorama I'm 17 I go to Douglas County High School and I'm interning for Miss Ann Geyer all right thank you um, hi, I'm Nicole Paul. I'm 17. I go to Chapel Hill High School, and I'm commissioning for um, Commissioner Courtney. Uh, hi, everybody. Got to know. My name is Ruben Tillman. Um, I'm current rising senior here at Texas A&M University. 
um, native of Douglasville. I've been here most of my life. Graduated from New Manchester 2016, and I'll be interning with Vice Chair Robinson. Yeah, I'm very excited. All right, thank you. Welcome. Hi, I'm Gabriela Castro. I just graduated from Gonzaga University with degrees in political science and philosophy, and I'm an uh, upcoming 1L at Pepperdine Law in Malibu, and I believe I'll be working with the chairwoman herself. You will. The <laughs> best place to go to yeah. law school, on the beach. Yeah, right? I, I can imagine myself studying <laughs> on the beach, you know, but it nice. might not be as glamorous. <laughs> Uh, good afternoon, my name is Justin Bell. I am a senior at Georgia State University and I will be interning for Commissioner Henry Mitchell. All right. The third. The third. The third. We want to make sure you put the third. <laughs> all right, well, welcome you all and you're very welcome. And we're so excited uh, to, that you're taking the time out of your summer to spend time with the Board of Commissioners to learn about what we do. So we're excited to it just, uh, just put everything we know in our minds into your minds to allow you to be successful as you go forward, okay? So you, you're excited, so are you ready? Yes. yes. All right then, okay, we will see you soon. All right, attorney, do we have a... Uh, do Madam Chair, Chair you may need uh, both litigation, personnel, and real estate today. All right. Board of Commissioners, do we have a motion to go into executive session? So moved. Yeah. We have a motion. <laughs> we got a second to? We have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 All right. Please get your uh, some definition of whatever. All right. We're back on line. Everybody who? Just wanted to see any, any other comment or any other announcements from the Board of Commissioners. I have one thing, just wanted to let y'all know that the Pine Commissioner got up just, we're oh. back on, on the air. Just wanted to just um, I'll let y'all know that the Pine Gold Rush Museum has been inducted in the Douglas County uh, Film Trail as part of the Douglas County Film Trail now. Uh, any other um, items to, to discuss before in this meeting from the Board of Commissioners? Any questions? Commissioner Dottie, you'd like to have a question? Uh, did you say the pine? Yeah, no, the, gold, the gold rush. The gold rush pine museum. I'm just trying to make sure I have the right name. The okay. gold rush museum. It be. has been included in our film trail. Uh huh. It, okay. it was inducted last week by uh, Colin Cash, and, and it's part of our film trail now here in Dutchess County. Good. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you're right. You'll probably see a news article, news. Maybe it'll be in the newspaper tomorrow. I just wanted to let you know. Okay. I got one. Yes. I want to clarify. Our right, world. Yeah, we do that. Yeah, we are. Mark, we've been there. Okay. <laughs> we, we do it wrong. Yeah, yeah, no. Um, um, <coughs> as it relates to a um, <coughs> action item tomorrow for the Box Hall project, there's two votes. Is that true? I want to clarify what we're doing wrong. That there is a, a vote to authorize the, the guarantee the bonds that's going to be up or down. Uh, as a single vote, mm -hmm. and the second one is authorization mm -hmm. to approve the intergovernmental agreement in 2016, and up and down the vote. Right. To amend it. To amend it. Yeah. Whatever the item is, just take it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just want to. I just want to clarify um, is that what we're doing. So yes, it, it will be separate. We're clear, so it's not going to be any um, last minute. Whatever is going to happen it's gonna between happen. now and tomorrow, we're still voting. Yes. I just want to know that the, the, the will of the board is to vote. Yes, we are. Regardless of side conversations, regardless of what everybody's involved in, have no problem with that. I'm just saying it, we will be voting tomorrow. That's all I'm asking. Right. I will call the question. Okay. okay. All right. So, so hold on. Hold on. Okay, I'm sorry. So just to, to add to what, what Kelly is saying, the question I think those guys are having and asking me for is, can they go back to the drawing board? I think it is what conversations is being had sidebar. What, what he's talking about. So uh, I don't know. Is it does it look good, bad, or indifferent? Is there a vote? Fine. If there is not a vote, or if they take it off the agenda, is, is that an option of theirs or an option of ours? It's, it's the the agenda belongs to this board and the chair. Period. Correct. It's not their option unless the chair and the board. But they can make the request. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's what that. I, I think that's probably what, what you're alluding to is, is that request a request? Well, not from me, but, uh, you know, it may or may not be, so. But. I just want to know who we're going to vote. Whatever action happens, yes. I'm not counseling them, I'm not advising exactly. them. 
I'm not doing any of that. I just wanted to make sure I heard from my peers that that is the will of the board. We're going to vote. I'm good. And, if, okay. and if the board is going to vote, then the, it'll have to, whatever takes place tomorrow will decide what happens. Exactly. You That's can't true. predetermine whether That's exactly somebody right. can make a motion to defeat both of them. Right. They're independent. Some can make a motion single item it. Uh, however, the chair takes up the agenda item that doesn't control. It's just an order of business unless right. it's changed by the chair. Correct. So the, the, uh, the you know, the, I that, that, that makes sense. sense. Yeah, I yeah. get the parliamentary yeah. rules. I'm just, one more time, I'm just, is, is that the consensus and the will of the board to vote tomorrow? All things come out of parliamentary rules, how, I mean, let, that's no yeah, job let, doing. Let's be careful in an open meeting, on, on, on a non-voting meeting, become getting a consensus to do or not do something more. I think what I understand the vice chair saying is, we understand it's being taken up and it's not being taken off the table. That's all I'm asking, but I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't need any caveats around what I'm asking. I'm asking something very specific. Are we voting tomorrow? That's it. We can talk about that. It's an open meeting. What I don't want to do is have a sidebar conversation, and then it comes back to we didn't change something. That's happened too many times. Right. One of the things I followed out this whole thing is about the process. Being very transparent. Put everything codified, every phone, Jennifer, everything that I did is all above board. I'm just asking someone, I'm trying to bring this to closure, which is, are we voting tomorrow? As the chairman of the Board of Commissioners, I will call the question That's tomorrow. That's what I'm asking. We will, we will vote. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, any other questions from the Board of Commissioners? At this point, this meeting is adjourned.